Story 1. I've been out of the Ranger service for two years now. Retirement, they call it. A chance to rest the old bones, to stoke the fire in the hearth, not a campfire under the open stars. Here in my cozy living room, with its walls adorned with photographs of family and the odd mounted deer head, a testament to my days in the wilderness, the comfort is almost overwhelming. The soft, worn armchair hugs my form, a stark contrast to the unforgiving ground I used to sleep on during my ranger days. Outside, the night is creeping in, swallowing the last remnants of daylight. The world outside the window transforms, the familiar becoming unfamiliar. Inside, the room is awash with the warm glow of the fire. My family, a tapestry of generations, gathers around, creating a cocoon of love and safety. My grandchildren, with their curious eyes and untamed energy, are a source of endless joy. The youngest of them, Lily, a sprightly girl with hair the color of sun-kissed wheat, shuffles closer to me, her eyes wide and expectant. Grandpa Carl, tell us a story. What's the scariest thing you've ever seen? She implores, her voice a delicate melody in the quiet room. Her request sparks a chorus of agreement from the others. I can't help but smile, feeling a mix of nostalgia and a tinge of something else. A shadow of unease, perhaps, as memories of my past adventures in the wilds resurface. You want to hear about the time your old grandpa used to work the wilds as a ranger, huh? I ask, already knowing the answer. Their eager nods and wide eyes are all the confirmation I need. Settling deeper into my chair, I gaze into the fire. The flames dance and flicker, casting playful shadows that transform the room, and in my mind's eye, they morph into the trees and creatures of the forest. You know, kids, I start, my voice a gentle rumble in the quiet room. Every forest in this world, it's a living organism. Got its own character, its own mood. I pause, letting the weight of my words settle in the room. The children lean in closer, their eyes reflecting the fire's glow. Sometimes it welcomes you, I continue, wraps you in its peace and beauty. But other times? My voice trails off, and I swallow the lump forming in my throat. Other times, it bears its teeth, brings danger, reminds you that you're a guest in its vast wilderness. The room falls silent, the crackling of the fire, the only sound. I take a deep breath, tasting the air, heavy with the scent of burning wood, and a hint of cinnamon from the apple pie cooling in the kitchen. In my years as a ranger, I say, my voice barely above a whisper, I've seen things in the forest that I can't explain. Things that would make your skin crawl, your heart race. Things that are better left unsaid. I notice the children's eyes widen, a mix of fear and fascination etched on their faces. It's a look I know well. One that I've seen in the eyes of fellow rangers when we shared tales of our encounters in the wilderness. Like what, Grandpa? Lily's voice is a small, trembling leaf in the still air. I hesitate, wondering if I should continue. But the story has already begun, and there's no turning back now. With a slow, deliberate motion, I stoke the fire, sending a cascade of sparks up the chimney. The flames grow higher, casting eerie shadows across the room. Well, I say, my voice steady despite the racing of my heart. There was this one time, deep in the heart of the forest, when I stumbled upon something, something unnatural. The children are silent now, hanging on my every word. I take a moment to collect my thoughts, to sift through the memories until I find the one that haunts me the most. I was a young man, green as the summer leaves when I started as an assistant chief ranger in the national park, I began, allowing a trace of whimsy to color my tone. Each word I uttered was a step back in time to an era that seemed as distant as the stars twinkling outside my window. It was a calling, not just a job, I mused, feeling a familiar stir of pride. I glanced around at their captivated faces, each a canvas of innocence and wonder. But one event from those days still chills my blood. I let the words hang, savoring the suspense that settled over the room like a delicate mist. The fire crackled in the hearth a symphony of snaps and pops that underscored the silence. I drew in the smoky air, letting it fill my lungs, a tactile reminder of those bygone days. Mid-July it was, sweltering like the devil's own breath, I continued. I was fresh, perhaps too eager, brimming with the zeal to make my mark, to safeguard the forest I so dearly loved. I paused, allowing myself a moment to relive the palpable excitement of my youth. 
What happened, Grandpa? Ben, my oldest grandson, leaned forward, his eyes bright with curiosity. His eagerness mirrored my own from decades past. The fire's glow shifted, casting ghostly patterns across the room. I felt a familiar tightness in my chest as memories, long dormant, began to stir. Let's take it slow, kids, I cautioned, my voice a low rumble. This is a tale that demands patience. Every morning in those days began with the ritual of preparing coffee. I would grind the beans by hand, savoring the rich aroma that filled my modest ranger's cabin. The coffee was strong and black, a vital kickstart for the long days ahead. Breakfast was a simple affair, usually a piece of fruit or a slice of bread with peanut butter, consumed while poring over maps and reports. The park was a living tapestry of greens and browns, an ever-changing landscape that was both my office and my sanctuary. The days were long, filled with the sounds of nature, the rustling of leaves, the distant calls of birds, and the occasional snap of a twig underfoot. My tasks varied, from patrolling the well-trodden paths to the less glamorous work of clearing fallen debris and maintaining signs. Evenings found me back in my cabin, a modest structure of logs and stone nestled in the heart of the forest. Here, I would unwind, often with a book or my journal, jotting down thoughts and observations by the flickering light of an oil lamp. Dinner was typically a Spartan meal, perhaps a can of beans heated over my small stove or a simple stew if I'd had the foresight to prepare it earlier. There was a rhythm to that life, a satisfying predictability punctuated by moments of unexpected beauty. A deer sighting at dawn, the sudden bloom of wildflowers, the ethereal mist that hung over the forest in the early morning. I found contentment in these simple pleasures, eager to absorb the wisdom of my more seasoned colleagues. They were a rugged bunch, each with a story etched into the lines of their faces and the calluses of their hands. These veterans of the wilderness welcomed me, a greenhorn, into their fold with a mix of good-natured ribbing and earnest mentorship. They taught me the intricacies of our duties, how to track animals, read the weather, and navigate the sprawling, untamed expanse we were charged with protecting. As the months cascaded into one another, I grew into my role, my footsteps becoming more confident with each patrol. The forest began to seem like an old friend, its secrets gradually unfolding before me. But with this growing confidence came a hint of overzealousness, a subtle shift in my perception of the woods and my place within them. I remember distinctly the day it happened. It was a day like any other, the morning air crisp and the sky a clear blue canvas. I set out on my patrol with a spring in my step, armed with the knowledge and skills imparted by my colleagues. Yet, beneath the surface of my routine, a current of overconfidence was swirling. I ventured deeper into the forest than I ever had before. The trees seemed to close in around me, their branches interlocking like the fingers of a giant hand above my head. The light dimmed as I progressed, the sun's rays struggling to penetrate the dense canopy. I was entranced by the beauty of it all, the sense of being completely enveloped by nature. Lunchtime found me beside a babbling brook, the water cold and refreshing as I splashed my face. My meal was simple. A sandwich of thick-cut bread and cured ham, a flask of black coffee, and an apple, its skin glistening in the dappled sunlight. I sat there, lost in the serenity, the sound of the water and the rustling leaves a natural symphony. The afternoon wore on as I continued my journey. The forest seemed to grow denser with each step, the underbrush thicker, and the terrain more rugged. I was far beyond the familiar trails and markers, in a part of the park that few had tread. It's a memory etched in my mind with the clarity of a frosty morning. The air was dense, filled with the musk of damp earth and decay, an olfactory reminder of the forest's perpetual cycle of life and death. Alone, with only the sound of my own footsteps for company, the forest's usual serenity morphed into something more sinister. The absence of human noise, usually a solace, now rang in my ears like a warning bell. Every rustle, every snap of a twig underfoot seemed amplified, as though the forest itself was holding its breath, watching my every move. And then, almost as if by design, I stumbled upon it. A small hill, nestled between the towering oaks, draped in a shroud of thick undergrowth. Atop this natural hillock sat its crown jewel, a cave, its mouth wide and dark, like a gaping maw ready to swallow me whole. I stood there, frozen, a young ranger confronted with the unknown. 
The mouth of the cave beckoned, an unspoken invitation that pulled at my very soul. It was as if the cave itself was alive, its dark void pulsing with an unseen energy, whispering my name on the wind. The rational part of my brain screamed warnings. Caves were the domain of wild animals, a sanctuary for the predators of the forest. It could be a bear's den, or worse, home to something unknown, something lurking in the depths of the earth. The risks were clear, yet the allure of the unknown was almost magnetic. I remember the internal battle that waged within me. Curiosity gnawed at my resolve, a siren call to explore the hidden depths of the cave. Yet, caution, that ever-present guardian, held me back. The teachings of my seasoned colleagues echoed in my mind. Respect the wilderness, understand its dangers. With a heart heavy with unfulfilled curiosity, I turned my back on the cave. The decision was a physical effort, like tearing away a part of myself that yearned for the unknown. As I walked away, the whispers seemed to grow louder, a chorus of unseen voices bidding me return. But I pressed on, the underbrush closing behind me, sealing the cave and its secrets away. The ranger hut, usually a place of camaraderie and light-hearted banter, was shrouded in a somber atmosphere as I relayed my encounter with the cave. My colleagues, a group normally unfazed by the mysteries and dangers of the wilderness, were visibly shaken by my tale. Their reactions, a mix of concern and fear, were a stark contrast to the jovial mood that had preceded my story. Bari, the senior ranger, a man whose words were as scarce as rain in a drought, reacted with an intensity that startled me. His usual stoic demeanor was replaced by a palpable sense of agitation. He stood abruptly, his chair scraping against the wooden floor, his voice a low rumble of concern. Did you see any warning signs, Carl? Did you see anything that said you shouldn't be there? His question caught me off guard. No, I replied honestly. There weren't any signs. Bari's reaction was immediate. His eyebrows, bushy and unkempt, knitted together in a frown of worry. He began pacing the room, a caged animal, his footsteps echoing on the wooden floor. His hands, rough and calloused from years of service, ran through his thinning hair in a gesture of deep anxiety. Finally, he stopped, turning to face me. His eyes, usually a calm pool of wisdom, were now stormy with concern. Listen here, boy, he said, his voice stern. You're never to go near that cave again. Do you understand? That part of the forest is strictly forbidden. It's dangerous. His words struck a chord of fear in me, but my curiosity was undimmed. But why? I pressed, unable to quell the inquisitive nature that had drawn me to the forest in the first place. Bari sighed, the weight of his years evident in the gesture. A look of deep sorrow etched his weathered face, as if he was recalling a painful memory. That cave, he began, his voice low and grave, has been here for centuries. No one knows how deep it goes or what lives within it. All we know is that whoever enters never returns. Man, beast, bird, none who venture in ever come out. His revelation sent shivers down my spine. The cave, which had seemed merely a curiosity, now loomed in my mind as a place of dread, a sinister enigma. Carl, Barry's voice softened. Avoid that part of the forest. We've lost good men to that damned cave. His words were a whisper, a confession of sorts, carrying the weight of unsolved mysteries and unspoken fears. The rest of the evening was steeped in a heavy silence. The usual routine of the hut, the preparation of dinner, the sharing of stories, was subdued. We ate in quiet reflection, the food, a simple stew of vegetables and venison, tasting bland in our mouths. In the years that followed, I followed Barry's advice, staying away from the forbidden part of the forest. The cave, with its dark allure and sinister mystery, became a no-go zone, a place etched in my memory but absent from my patrols. As a ranger, my duty was to safeguard the wilderness, a role I embraced with dedication. The forest was my charge, a living entity that I was sworn to protect. I respected its boundaries, both seen and unseen, adhering to the natural order that governed its existence. Life in the park continued, marked by the steady rhythm of the seasons. The summers were a vibrant display of green, the forest alive with the chatter of wildlife and the rustle of leaves. Autumns brought a cascade of colors, the trees shedding their foliage in a final spectacular show before the onset of winter. The winters were silent and solemn, the snow blanketing the ground in a pristine white, muting the sounds of the forest. 
and then spring would arrive, breathing new life into the world, the cycle beginning anew. I patrolled the trails, ensuring the safety of visitors and the health of the park. I monitored the wildlife, noting changes in their behavior and habitats. I maintained the park's infrastructure, repairing trails and signs. As time marched on, I felt myself change. The young, eager ranger, once filled with a sense of adventure and curiosity, matured into a seasoned guardian of the forest. My steps became more measured, my eyes keener, my understanding of the wilderness deeper. The park, too, underwent changes. New trails were blazed, old ones retired. The flora and fauna adapted to the shifting climate, an unspoken reminder of the passage of time. Visitors came and went, each leaving their footprints on the trails, a transient mark on the timeless landscape. With Bari's retirement, the mantle of Senior Ranger fell upon my shoulders. It was a role I accepted with a mix of pride and trepidation, aware of the immense responsibilities it entailed. I now had jurisdiction over the entire park, including the mysterious, forbidden part of the forest where the cave was located. I took my duties seriously, ensuring the safety of hikers and wildlife alike. The trails were my domain, each path and clearing familiar to me as the lines on my own hands. The signs warning off the curious from straying towards the cave were always prominent, a constant reminder of the unseen dangers lurking within the forest. I also took it upon myself to share the legend of the cave with every new recruit. It was a story that needed to be told, a cautionary tale to instill vigilance and respect for the untamed heart of the wilderness. One such new recruit was Steve, a young man brimming with the vitality of youth and an eagerness to learn. He had a sparkle in his eye, the kind that spoke of dreams and aspirations yet to be fulfilled. I saw in him a reflection of my younger self, and it stirred a sense of responsibility within me to guide him to temper his enthusiasm with the wisdom of experience. I remember the day I first took Steve on patrol, the sun just cresting the horizon, bathing the forest in a golden glow. The air was crisp, the scent of pine and earth mingling in a heady perfume. We walked the trails, my strides measured, his eager, as I pointed out the various flora and fauna, the subtle signs of the forest that revealed its secrets. Steve was a quick learner, absorbing the knowledge I imparted like a sponge. He took to the routines of ranger life with enthusiasm, whether it was checking trail cameras, maintaining paths, or conducting wildlife surveys. His presence brought a renewed energy to the team, a reminder of the passion that had drawn us all to this life. But when it came to the cave, I noticed a flicker of fascination in Steve's eyes, a glimmer of the same curiosity that had once drawn me to its maw. I reiterated the warning, my voice grave. Remember, Steve? That cave is off-limits. Its secrets are not ours to uncover. The day began like any other, the sun peeking over the horizon, casting a golden glow over the forest. But that tranquility shattered with a crackle of the radio, the excited voice on the other end delivering news that turned my blood cold. Several hikers, along with Steve, had gone missing. The pit of my stomach dropped as they relayed their last known location, perilously close to the restricted area of the forest. Anger surged within me, a turbulent river of emotion. I was furious at Steve for his recklessness, at myself for trusting him too much. But anger wouldn't solve this crisis. Action would. I gathered my gear with a sense of urgency. Each item, the compass, the flashlight, the first aid kit, feeling heavier with the gravity of the situation. As I trekked towards the restricted area, my initial anger gradually morphed into a gnawing worry. The safety of Steve and the campers weighed heavily on my mind their well-being a responsibility that rested squarely on my shoulders. I tried to maintain a clear head, pushing aside the burgeoning dread that sought to cloud my judgment. The journey through the familiar trails was a silent one. The usual chorus of the forest muted as if in anticipation of what was to come. I walked with a purpose, my steps brisk, my senses heightened. The forest around me felt different, almost sentient, as though it was aware of the gravity of my mission. Crossing into the Forbidden Zone was like stepping into another world. The air shifted, becoming denser, laden with an unspoken warning. It was as if the very atmosphere was charged with a strange energy, a force that seemed to pull me inexorably towards the hill, towards the enigmatic cave. This force, this inexplicable draw towards the cave, was unsettling. It felt as though invisible threads were tugging at me, guiding me towards an uncertain fate. 
The rational part of my mind screamed against it, warning of the dangers that lay within the dark recesses of the cave. But another part, a primal, curious part, whispered seductive promises of discovery and understanding. I halted, a battle raging within me. The memory of my last encounter with the cave's power loomed large in my mind. I had been fortunate to escape its grasp then, but would I be so lucky this time? The thought of being ensnared in its tantalizing web was both terrifying and compelling, but my hesitation was brief. The realization hit me with the force of a thunderclap. As Chief Ranger, it was my duty to find and rescue those under my charge. I couldn't allow fear or superstition to deter me from my responsibility. The abandoned campsite lay in a small clearing, a scene of chaos frozen in time. The tents, once a safe haven for the missing hikers and Steve, now stood desolate, their flaps open and fluttering in the icy wind. Belongings were strewn about, a silent testament to a hurried, panicked departure. The sight sent a shiver down my spine, the sense of urgency palpable even in their absence. I approached the campsite with a mix of trepidation and determination. My eyes, honed by years of experience, scanned the area meticulously. I noted the position of the tents, the scattered gear, the half-eaten food on a makeshift table. Each detail was a piece of the puzzle, a clue to the events that had transpired. The air was chilly, the wind carrying whispers of leaves and the subtle scents of the forest. The silence was pervasive, broken only by the occasional creak of a branch or the distant call of a bird. It was a stark contrast to the usual symphony of the wilderness. I felt a wave of unease wash over me as I surveyed the scene. Something had driven them from this place in haste, something more fearsome than the typical threats of the forest. The cold dread that seeped into my bones was a familiar sensation, one that I had felt years ago when I first encountered the cave. The campsite's proximity to the cave was no coincidence. I could sense the ominous presence of the cave, its dark maw beckoning me, pulling me towards it with an almost magnetic force. The dread in my stomach twisted tighter with each step I took towards the cave. A part of me yearned to turn back, to escape the oppressive atmosphere that hung over the area. The rational side of my mind screamed warnings, urging me to retreat to the safety and familiarity of the known trails. But the ranger in me, the man who had sworn an oath to protect and serve, knew that there was no turning back. With each step, the cave loomed larger in my view. The air grew heavier, as if saturated with the weight of unspoken secrets and ancient fears. The silence around me deepened, a void that seemed to swallow even the sound of my own breathing. The rustling in the underbrush was the first indication that I wasn't alone in this part of the forest. My heart rate accelerated, every sense sharpening, attuned to the slightest sound, the smallest movement. Then, breaking through the eerie calm, a figure emerged from the gloom, her sudden appearance nearly knocking me off balance. It was a woman, her appearance disheveled, hair wild and tangled, eyes wide with a terror that was almost palpable. She stumbled forward, her steps unsteady, before collapsing at my feet, her breathing ragged and desperate. I instinctively crouched beside her, my ranger training kicking in. My voice was calm a stark contrast to her frantic gasps as I tried to soothe her to bring her back from the brink of hysteria. Gradually, her breathing began to steady, the wild look in her eyes dimming as she became aware of her surroundings. What's your name? Where are the others? I asked, my voice firm yet gentle, hoping to glean some understanding of the situation. She looked at me, her eyes reflecting the remnants of fear. Emily, she managed to say, her voice a trembling whisper. I'm Emily. We... We were reporters. We came to do a story on the cave. About its secrets. Steve. He was our guide. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. They had ventured into the forbidden part of the forest, lured by the allure and mystery of the cave, despite the dangers. My heart sank with each word she uttered, the gravity of the situation becoming increasingly apparent. As Emily's breathing normalized, I helped her to sit up, checking her for injuries. Her clothes were torn, dirt and leaves clinging to the fabric. But she seemed physically unharmed, albeit shaken. I looked into Emily's eyes, seeing the trauma of her experience etched into her gaze. The need to find the others, to understand what had happened here, pressed heavily upon me. I gently probed for more information. Can you tell me what happened? Where are the others? Sitting beside Emily, 
her figure small and fragile against the vastness of the forest. I listened intently as she continued her harrowing tale. Her voice was a mere whisper, a delicate sound that seemed at odds with the chilling story she recounted. They had started their day with a sense of adventure, setting up their equipment to film near the mouth of the cave. The atmosphere was lively, filled with the chatter of excited voices and the clatter of camera gear. But as they approached the cave, something inexplicable occurred. A strange, almost hypnotic pull emanated from the depths of the cave, drawing them inexorably closer. Emily's description of resisting this force was haunting. She had stopped at the very edge of the abyss, her feet rooted to the ground as if by some unseen anchor, while her companions, including Steve, were helplessly drawn into the cave's dark embrace. Her voice trembled as she recounted what happened next. She described the eerie silence that fell over the cave's entrance, a silence so profound it felt like a physical presence. Then, the screams began, distant and muffled, as if coming from the very bowels of the earth. The pleas for help, the sounds of terror, echoed from the cave, painting a picture of unimaginable horror. Emily's eyes, wide with remembered fear, flickered with the light of the campfire. She spoke of Steve emerging from the darkness, his face pale and gaunt, his eyes empty of life. He stood at the mouth of the cave, a ghostly figure, beckoning her to join him. His voice, once warm and familiar, now carried an unnatural, compelling tone that tugged at her very soul. She recounted the struggle within her, the almost overwhelming desire to heed Steve's call, to step into the darkness beside him. It was a battle of wills, one she had narrowly won, managing to turn and flee into the safety of the forest. The fear in Emily's eyes as she looked at me was palpable. Her hands trembled as she clutched at her torn jacket, her body language speaking of trauma and deep-seated terror. She pleaded with me, her voice breaking, to go into the cave and rescue her friends, her colleagues, and Steve. She held on to a sliver of hope that they were still alive, that they could still be saved from whatever nightmare had claimed them in the depths of the cave. Emily's account, laden with fear and desperation, left a heavy weight in my heart. The cave, already shrouded in mystery and dread, now felt even more ominous. Despite her pleas, I knew that venturing into the cave without proper preparation was a risk too great. The safety of Emily, myself, and the potential survivors was paramount. We made our way back to the ranger cabin, the journey marked by silence and the heavy tread of our steps. Upon reaching the safety of the cabin, I wasted no time in contacting the sheriff. I relayed the situation in as much detail as possible, my voice steady but underlined with urgency. Emily, still visibly shaken, sat wrapped in a blanket, her eyes distant, lost in the horror of her experience. The arrival of dawn brought with it the sheriff and a specialist he had enlisted, equipped with a solution tailored for our situation. A small, sophisticated drone, equipped with a camera and remote control, was to be our eyes and ears into the unknown depths of the cave. Emily, in no condition to face the cave again, stayed behind at the cabin, her recovery from the ordeal a slow, painstaking process. We gathered at the mouth of the cave, the morning light casting long shadows across the ground. The drone, a compact piece of technology, buzzed with a quiet hum as the specialist made the final adjustments. The anticipation was palpable, a mix of hope and fear, as we prepared to uncover the secrets of the cave without endangering any more lives. As the drone embarked on its journey, delving into the cave's mouth, the three of us huddled around the small screen that displayed its live feed. The drone's light cut through the darkness, illuminating the damp, gnarled rocks that formed the cave's interior. The view was a stark contrast to the bright morning outside, a reminder of the different world that lay beneath our feet. Our eyes remained fixed on the screen, watching every twist and turn the drone took. The cave's interior was a labyrinth of passages and chambers, its walls slick with moisture. The drone navigated the space with precision, its camera capturing every detail, yet revealing nothing but the natural formations of the cave. The tension in the air grew with each passing minute, the screen showing nothing but the barren, rocky terrain of the cave. The sheriff, a man of few words, watched intently, his expression one of concentration and concern. The specialist, his fingers deftly controlling the drone, was focused on the task, his brow furrowed in concentration. As the drone ventured deeper, the silence in the cave was overwhelming, broken only by the distant sound of dripping water and the quiet weir of the drone's propellers. The atmosphere was oppressive, the darkness seemingly absorbing the light from the drone, 
casting eerie shadows on the walls. The journey of the drone felt like an eternity, each second stretching out as we waited for any sign of Steve or the missing campers. The drone's journey into the cave had been uneventful until that moment. Shadows flickered across the feed, transient and elusive, like phantoms in the dark. My heart raced as something white briefly appeared within the frame, a fleeting glimpse that set my nerves on edge. Amidst the rocky terrain and eerie silence of the cave, the drone then uncovered something more tangible. An abandoned camera, its lens staring blankly into the abyss, and a pair of boots, discarded and forlorn. The realization hit hard. These were the operator's gear, silent witnesses to an untold story. However, just as we leaned in closer to the screen, hoping to uncover more clues, the specialist's voice cut through the tension. He announced the onset of severe signal interference, a technical obstacle that threatened our mission. The drone, an expensive and sophisticated piece of equipment, was at risk of being lost to the cave's mysterious depths. After a brief, intense discussion, we decided to retrieve the abandoned camera. It could hold vital information, clues to what had befallen the missing group. The drone's mechanical claws delicately lifted the camera, but as it did, the feed became erratic, the image jumping and flickering on the screen. The drone began its retreat, but then, in a turn of events that seemed almost unthinkable, it stopped abruptly. The screen filled with static, a chaotic dance of black and white that obscured our view. It was as if the drone was being held back by an unseen adversary, an invisible force that defied logic and reason. We watched in disbelief as the drone was slowly dragged back into the depths of the cave. The tension in the air was palpable, a mix of fear and frustration. The static on the screen grew more intense, a visual representation of our growing sense of dread. And then, in a final act of defiance, the camera slipped from the drone's grasp. We heard the sound of it clattering onto the rocky floor, the noise echoing through the cave's chambers and into our ears. The feed went completely dark, the screen now a blank canvas of black. The specialist, his face a mask of disbelief and disappointment, tried in vain to re-establish a connection. But it was clear that the drone was lost, swallowed by the cave's insatiable appetite for secrets. The retrieval of the camera, lying ominously close to the cave's entrance, was a moment driven by sheer instinct. The fear that had been a cold whisper in my spine turned into a roaring torrent as I rushed into the cave. My heart pounded against my ribs, each beat a loud drum in the eerie silence of the cave. The urge to delve deeper was strong, an almost magnetic pull, but I resisted, focusing solely on the task at hand. As I grabbed the camera, the cold, hard ground beneath my feet serving as a stark reminder of the cave's unforgiving nature. A guttural growl echoed from the depths of the cave. It was a sound that spoke of ancient terrors, of things best left undiscovered. Without looking back, I sprinted out of the cave, the sound of my own footsteps a frantic rhythm in my flight to safety. Back at the cabin, the sheriff, the specialist, and I sat in a heavy silence, each of us processing the day's eerie events. Our minds were a whirlwind of confusion and fear, grappling with the reality that the cave was not just a geological formation, but something alive, something malevolent. I held the camera, its weight in my hands a tangible link to the missing group. It was a beacon of hope in the thick fog of despair that had settled upon us. As we gathered around the small TV in the cabin, the footage from the camera began to play, casting a flickering light in the dim room. The screen showed Emily, her face illuminated by the camera's light, narrating something about the cave. Her voice was steady at first, but then it faltered, trailing off into an unsettling silence. The abrupt stop in her narration sent chills down my spine. The silence a suffocating blanket that seemed to stretch on endlessly. The camera panned to Steve and the other reporter, their expressions frozen, their eyes vacant. They stood motionless, like statues, their breaths held in a moment of suspended reality. The air in the cabin grew heavy, the tension palpable as we watched the screen, transfixed by the bizarre scene unfolding before us. Then, without warning, they began to move. Their steps were slow, deliberate, yet devoid of any human warmth or intention. It was as if they were being controlled by some unseen force, their bodies mere vessels for a will that was not their own. They moved towards the cave, their movements synchronized, a disturbing dance of puppets on strings. The footage continued, the cameraman's movements synchronized with the others, a macabre procession led by Emily, with Steve at the forefront. 
They moved in single file, drawn inexorably into the cave's gaping maw. The camera, held by the last person in line, cast a solitary beam of light, an eerie illumination for their descent into the unknown. My earlier impressions from the drone footage now seemed an understatement. Viewing the cave through this lens, the environment felt even more unnatural, more sinister. The cave's interior resembled less a natural formation and more an abandoned mine. The walls and the ground, everything bore unmistakable signs of human alteration, of being man-made, shaped by tools and hands long forgotten. Then, the camera revealed a sight that sent a chill down my spine. The ground was littered with bones, a macabre tableau of both human and animal remains. They lay scattered, discarded carelessly, as if the cave itself was a grave, a final resting place for the unfortunate. The grotesque nature of the scene was overwhelming, but it was what happened next that seared itself into my memory, leaving an indelible mark on my soul. The camera panned, and for a moment, the light caught something in the darkness. Figures, barely discernible, moving among the bones. They were hunched, their movements unnatural, almost animalistic. The light glinted off their eyes, a brief flash of reflection that spoke of a malevolent awareness. The footage from the camera played on, revealing a scene that defied all logic and understanding. The human-like figures, their skin an unnatural shade of pale, almost translucent, moved with a slow, deliberate grace. One by one, they approached the members of the group, their hands reaching out with an eerie gentleness. Steve was the first to be led away. The figure that approached him extended a hand, which he took without any sign of resistance. They disappeared together into the darkness, a sight that was both chilling and mesmerizing. The reporter and Emily followed, each guided away by these haunting figures, their movements seemingly devoid of their own will. Finally, it was the cameraman's turn. The camera, now our only window into this nightmare, gave us a close-up view of the creatures. The light from the camera revealed skin so translucent that a network of blue veins was visible beneath. Their mouths were filled with sharp, almost transparent teeth, akin to those of a shark. But it was their fangs, covered in thin red vessels, that stood out starkly. Their faces, if they could be called that, were the stuff of nightmares. I saw their eyes, black and red, swirling pools of darkness that seemed to draw in all light. The low, purring sound that emanated from them filled the cabin, a sound that seemed to vibrate in the very air. The creature reached out for the cameraman, and in that moment, the camera fell from his grasp. The footage became a chaotic tumble of images, ending with the final shot of a pair of feet, the cameraman's, disappearing into the dark. The screen went black, plunging the cabin into silence. The only sound was the crackling of the fire, a stark contrast to the horrors we had just witnessed. The sheriff, the specialist, and I sat motionless, each of whose processing the nightmarish reality that the footage had unveiled. The creatures in the cave were unlike anything we had ever seen or imagined. Their presence, their very existence, was a mystery that defied all rational explanation. The sight of the group being led away, one by one, was a haunting image that would linger in my mind a chilling reminder of the unknown dangers that lurked within the cave. The unsettling footage had left me with a vortex of questions that whirled chaotically in my mind. The nature of these pale, otherworldly creatures, their motives, and the fate of those they had taken. All these thoughts spun in my head, each more troubling than the last. And then, there was Emily. The puzzle of her escape, her story, her silence about these beings. It all gnawed at me a persistent itch that demanded to be scratched. I had left Emily resting in a room, her state fragile but seemingly safe. Now, with a sense of urgency propelling me, I made my way to the room. The door swung open to reveal a scene that froze the blood in my veins. Emily's hair was scattered carelessly on the floor, strands of it spread in a chaotic array. But it was the pieces of human skin that sent a shiver down my spine. They lay there, small, flaky remnants of a horror too deep to comprehend. And there, on the bed lay a figure that was once Emily. Her body was pale, almost translucent, bald, and utterly still, as if in a deep slumber. Her transformation was shocking, aligning her more with the creatures from the cave than with any human. A wave of fear washed over me, its cold grip tightening around my heart. I stepped forward, my movements slow and cautious. There was a glimmer of hope that Emily, despite her transformation, 
might still possess enough humanity to explain what had transpired in the cave. But as I approached, Emily's senses, now seemingly heightened beyond human norms, detected my presence. Her eyes snapped open, black and red, mirroring those of the creatures in the footage. She emitted a low guttural sound, primal and unsettling. In a flash, she leaped from the bed and hurtled toward the window. The glass shattered under her force, the sound piercing the silence of the night. I stood there, stunned, as Emily vanished into the darkness, her form a fleeting shadow against the backdrop of the forest. The realization downed on me. Emily had become one with the cave and its inhabitants. The cave was no longer just her refuge. It was her home. She had escaped into the woods, and I knew exactly where she was heading. Back to that cavernous abyss that had claimed her. The room felt oppressively empty in her absence, the remnants of her transformation a stark reminder of the nightmarish reality we were facing. I stood there, in the midst of the chaos, my mind racing to piece together the fragments of this ever-deepening mystery. The thunderous crash of lightning outside the window was like a punctuation mark to my story, its boom resonating through the room. My grandchildren, their young faces a canvas of fear and suspense, reacted with screams, the tension built up by the story finding its release. Lily, the youngest, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and fascination, approached me, seeking comfort in the familiar, reassuring presence of her grandfather. Grandpa, you made it all up, didn't you? After all, such a cave doesn't exist. These creatures don't exist? Her voice was a soft, trembling melody, a stark contrast to the storm raging outside. I smiled at her, a gentle, affectionate curve of my lips that I hoped would ease her fears. Stroking her hair, I reassured her. Of course, Lily. Grandpa just wanted to scare you a bit. I'm sorry about that. Old joker that I am. My words were a balm to her rattled nerves. I gathered her into my arms, her small body warm and real, a reminder of the joy and innocence that life held. We decided then to move to a lighter, happier activity eating cake. The sweet, comforting ritual of sharing a treat was a perfect way to dispel the remnants of the scary story, to bring back smiles and laughter. Later that night, when the grandchildren were tucked into their cribs, their breathing deep and peaceful, a testament to their journey into dreamland, I found myself drawn to my office. There, hidden away from the world, lay reminders of a past I had long carried with me, Steve's picture and the camera with the footage of that mysterious cave. These items had been my silent companions, a weight of guilt and unanswered questions that I had borne for too long. The night, still and dark, felt like the right time to let go, to release the ghosts of the past. I took Steve's picture, its edges worn from the passage of time, and held it for a moment. The image, a frozen moment of a life lost to the mysteries of the cave, stared back at me. With a heavy heart, I placed it in the fireplace, watching as the flames began to consume it, the picture curling and blackening, a final farewell to a friend and a chapter of my life. Then came the camera, its lens that had captured horrors beyond comprehension. It was time to destroy the tapes, to rid the world of the nightmares they held. I dismantled the camera, its parts clattering onto the table, and then, with a finality that felt like a closing of a book, I placed them into the fire. The flames danced and flickered, consuming the remnants of a past that had haunted me. I watched as the fire reduced them to ashes, the images, the memories, the guilt, all turning to smoke and disappearing into the night. As I stood there, watching the last embers die out, I felt a sense of release, a lifting of a burden I had carried for too long. The cave, with its mysteries and horrors, was now a closed chapter, a story told and ended. The night was silent, the storm having passed, leaving a sense of calm and peace. I turned off the lights in my office and made my way to my room, feeling lighter, unburdened. The story of the cave was over, its secrets now just ashes in the fireplace. It was time to move on, to embrace the present and the future, to cherish the moments with my family, to live in the light, away from the shadows of the past. Story 2 This incident took place around the year 1960. I was dispatched on an expedition to excavate the ancient Sumerian city of Uruk, nestled in the southern part of Mesopotamia, in what is now modern-day Iraq. The dig was organized by an international consortium of archaeologists, including eminent scholars from Iraq, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. 
Our mission was a lofty one, to unravel the early stages of urban life and to unearth examples of writing, for it was in Sumer that the cuneiform script first emerged, marking the dawn of recorded history. Upon my arrival at the excavation site, I found the operation in full swing. The sun blazed down with an unyielding ferocity, its rays mercilessly scorching the earth. My throat felt parched, constricted by the relentless heat. Around a structure that bore resemblance to an ancient house, a flurry of activity buzzed. The majority were local Arabs, hired to assist with the labor-intensive task of excavation, their faces etched with the marks of hard toil under the unforgiving sun. Among them, a tall figure caught my eye, a man of European descent, around 35 years old. He was making his way towards me. The man, upon seeing me, quickened his pace, and we soon found ourselves in a cordial introduction. His name was James Wellington, a professor from Oxford University. He had a robust build, his face adorned with sharp, piercing blue eyes and a neatly trimmed beard that lent him a look of academic distinction. His skin bore the tan of many days under the sun, a testament to his dedication to fieldwork. Shortly after our exchange, a woman approached us. Her presence was streakingly elegant. She was Claudine Dupont, a Frenchwoman from the Sorbonne. Her brunette hair was pulled back into a tidy bun, revealing the sharp contour of her high cheekbones and her deep, observant eyes that seemed to study the world with an inquisitive intensity. Our conversation quickly delved into the profound implications of our findings. James, with a gleam in his eye, spoke passionately about the significance of the Sumerian cuneiform. It's not just any form of writing. It's the dawn of recorded history as we know it. Each tablet, each inscription we uncover, could rewrite what we understand about the ancient world, he said with a fervor that was infectious. Claudine, her gaze fixed thoughtfully on the distant ruins, added, Indeed, these symbols of chit and clay are not mere marks. They are the voices of a civilization long silenced, beckoning us to uncover their stories. As I settled into the rhythm of the camp, my work began in earnest. The conditions were harsh, the climate unforgiving. We toiled under a relentless sun, our bodies weary, our spirits fueled by the promise of discovery. The excavation process was meticulous, requiring patience and precision. Each layer of earth we removed revealed secrets buried for millennia. We found household items, each telling a story of daily life long forgotten. Intriguing statuettes, likely once revered, now lay silent in our hands. One particular find, a small clay tablet intricately inscribed, captivated my attention. Its message, encrypted in ancient script, awaited deciphering, a puzzle spanning across the ages. A month into our expedition, an unexpected visitor arrived at our camp. He was a local Arab man, introducing himself as Malik. His appearance was rugged, his face marked by the harshness of the desert life. His eyes, dark and penetrating, held a glint of mystery. One of our workers, Ahmed, with whom I had developed a camaraderie, recognized him instantly. Ahmed's face contorted with a mix of fear and contempt. Malik, seemingly indifferent to the tension his presence caused, turned to address us. His proposal was intriguing, yet laced with uncertainty. He claimed to know of an ancient burial mound, a site untouched by modern hands, offering to guide us there for a fee. Ahmed, pulling me aside, whispered words of caution, his voice laden with concern. Be wary, Malik is known for his dubious dealings, he advised. Yet, the lure of the unknown was too tempting to ignore, and so, we agreed to Malik's proposition. The next day presented us with a challenge. Convincing the local laborers to accompany us to the site proved more difficult than anticipated. Upon learning of our intended destination, they balked, their faces clouded with fear. The site, it seemed, was shrouded in superstition and dread. Despite their initial resistance, the promise of generous compensation eventually persuaded a few to relent. Our journey took us several miles north of our excavation site, traversing arid landscapes and undulating dunes. Our destination was near a river, where several ancient mounds rose ominously against the horizon. The atmosphere there was palpably eerie, a sense of unease hanging in the air, though its source eluded my rational mind. We set up camp near these mounds, the setting sun casting long, ominous shadows across the landscape. As night fell, 
an unexpected storm erupted, its sudden ferocity catching us off guard. Lightning streaked across the sky, illuminating the ancient mounds and flashes of ghostly light. The locals who accompanied us were visibly shaken, muttering prayers and old wives' tales of malevolent spirits. Their fear was contagious, casting a shadow of foreboding over our camp. Despite the tempestuous night, we endured, and with the dawn of a new day, we began our exploration of these mysterious mounds. We had finally leveled the ancient mound after days of painstaking labor, revealing a solid, impenetrable stone slab beneath the earth. This discovery was both intriguing and perplexing. There was no hint of an entrance, no crevice nor seam to indicate how one might gain access to what lay beneath. We circled the structure, our hands tracing over the cool, weathered stone, feeling every inch for some clue. The cube, a massive stone structure, loomed like a silent guardian of forgotten secrets. Its dimensions were imposing, about 15 feet in both length and width, and it delved into the depths of the earth, its bottom unseen and its purpose unknown. Days turned into nights as we deliberated over our next course of action. The structure was like nothing any of us had encountered before. Its very existence defied conventional understanding. Professor Dupont, with her extensive knowledge of ancient architecture, was particularly baffled. It's like a puzzle waiting to be solved, she mused one evening, as we sat around the campfire, our eyes fixed on the enigmatic stone cube under the starlit sky. Our breakthrough came unexpectedly on a quiet evening, the sun was setting, casting a warm, golden glow over the site. The air was filled with the tranquil sounds of the closing day when Malik's scream shattered the calm. We rushed over to find him standing on the cube's lid, pointing frantically at the ground. There, right where we had checked countless times before, was a series of cuneiform inscriptions illuminated by the last rays of the setting sun. We couldn't believe our eyes. Had the inscription been there all along, visible only at this precise moment? The inscription was cryptic, its ancient script weaving a chilling warning. Beyond this threshold lies not peace, but a deep slumber, guarded by a sentinel whose dreams are darker than night. We hastily transcribed the message, knowing its significance. That night we gathered in our tent, the air thick with theories and speculations. It's common for tombs to have curses or warnings, James remarked, but this is different, more foreboding. Dupont nodded in agreement, her face etched with concern. Despite the ominous nature of the message, our curiosity was piqued. We were on the brink of a potentially monumental discovery. The following day, as the sun once again neared the horizon, we gathered around the stone cube, watching as the inscription re-emerged in the fading light. I stepped forward, the words echoing in my mind, and read them aloud. To our collective astonishment, the slab trembled, and a section in the center slowly retracted, revealing a dark opening. A hushed silence fell over us. The opening beckoned, a gateway into the unknown. Professor Dupont, usually composed, seemed apprehensive. We must proceed with caution, she warned. We don't know what lies ahead. Armed with flashlights, we began our descent down the stone staircase. The steps were worn but solid, each one leading us deeper into the heart of the mystery. Reaching the bottom, we found ourselves in a large chamber, its walls adorned with cuneiform inscriptions and elaborate carvings. The images depicted scenes of ancient rituals, celestial bodies, and deities, their eyes seeming to follow us as we moved. The air was cool and surprisingly fresh, indicating a hidden ventilation system, a marvel of ancient engineering. I felt a slight draft and, curious, followed it down a narrow corridor. The passage was lined with more inscriptions and carvings, each telling a part of a story long forgotten. The corridor ended at a heavy door, flanked by two imposing statues of women with the heads of owls, their gaze stern and unyielding. Approaching the door, I noticed a small opening just large enough to peer through. I shone my flashlight inside and gasped. The chamber beyond was small, but filled with an incredible sight. In the center stood an open sarcophagus, the lid lying beside it. Inside, the mummified remains of what appeared to be a high-ranking individual, adorned with ancient jewelry and funerary items. But it was what surrounded the sarcophagus that took my breath away. The chamber was filled with treasures, gold artifacts, jewelry, beautifully crafted vessels and statues. 
their surfaces catching the light from my flashlight and casting a golden glow. I beckoned my colleagues, and together we meticulously examined the heavy stone door that had kept the tomb's secrets for millennia. Its surface was smooth, save for faint, time-worn carvings that spoke of ancient craftsmanship. With a small crowbar, we gently nudged the door, which moved with surprising ease, revealing the tomb's interior. We stepped inside, our flashlights cutting through the darkness, revealing a room bathed in the golden glow of untold riches. The treasures were a sight to behold. The chamber was filled with gold artifacts that shimmered under our lights, intricate jewelry that hinted at the wealth and status of the tomb's occupant, and statues carved from rare stones. The tapestries, though faded, still held vibrant stories woven into their threads, depicting gods, kings, and mythical beasts. Among the treasures, there were beautifully crafted weapons and shields, their metalwork exquisite and uncurated. It was a cache that spoke of a civilization that valued artistry, power, and the eternal preservation of their legacy. Approaching the sarcophagus, I found it difficult to peel my eyes away from the body of the woman inside. Her blackened skin clung tightly to her skeletal frame, creating a macabre visage that was unsettling in its preservation. Her sparse hair created a stark contrast against her skull, and her face was indeed inhuman, almost demonic. The large fangs and the absence of a nose replaced by two narrow slits gave her an eerie, nightmarish appearance. She was dressed in a tunic richly adorned with gold, signifying her high status. A wave of unease washed over me as I studied her. Her presence was chilling, as if she still held some malevolent power even in death. Professor Dupont came up beside me, her voice tinged with a mix of fear and fascination. Is this... a demon? she asked. I responded, trying to maintain a rational perspective. It's possible she was disfigured in the cremation process, or she might have looked like this in life, and of course time has its effects. While we were pondering this, the bravest of our local helpers entered. Initially their eyes lit up with the sight of the treasure, but as soon as they saw the sarcophagus, their faces twisted in horror, and they fled screaming Lilith. We turned to each other in confusion. Lilith? We echoed among ourselves. I knew Lilith as a figure shrouded in myth and darkness. In ancient Sumerian beliefs, Lilith was often depicted as a powerful and fearsome demon of the night. She was associated with the wind and was believed to be a bearer of disease, illness and death. The legend spoke of her as a figure who defied the established order, a symbol of unbridled freedom and a harbinger of doom. Her name was often invoked to explain the unexplainable, the tragedies that befell the innocent. Maybe she was a priestess or a shaman dedicated to Lilith, I speculated. It was not uncommon for ancient cultures to bury their important figures with symbols of their faith or deity. We decided it was best to inform the local authorities about our discovery and to request additional security. The news of the tomb and its contents spread quickly, and soon a makeshift camp formed around the site. Local military personnel arrived and secured the perimeter, their presence a stark contrast to the ancient mysteries that lay within. Our camp, located near the tranquil riverbank, became a hive of activity as we worked to document and preserve the artifacts. The local community, usually buzzing with curiosity, kept a respectful distance, their superstitions keeping them away from the tomb. Even the soldiers, despite their discipline, were visibly on edge, casting nervous glances towards the tomb as they patrolled. As we cataloged the artifacts, carefully extracting and preparing them for transport to the local museum, an uneasy calm settled over the camp. The days were filled with the meticulous work of preservation, but it was the nights that held a palpable tension, a sense of foreboding that hung in the air. It was during this time of quiet unease that an incident occurred, setting off a series of strange and frightening events that would forever change our understanding of the ancient world. One morning as we entered the tomb, I immediately felt something was off. The air seemed thicker, charged with an unspoken energy that hadn't been present before. Around us, rows of artifacts lay meticulously arranged, each tagged with a carefully written label. I scanned the room, trying to discern the source of this subtle but palpable change. My gaze inevitably settled on the mummy. Something about her appeared different. Her skin, once akin to old leather, now seemed slightly more supple, as if it had somehow absorbed moisture from the air. Her body, 
previously gaunt and emaciated, appeared subtly fuller, as though flesh had begun to grow back on her bones. I rubbed my eyes, doubting my senses, and pointed out this unnerving observation to my colleagues. Together we circled the sarcophagus, examining the mummy from every angle. The change was subtle, yet undeniable. The skin had a newfound tinge of color, and the body's contours seemed less harsh, less skeletal. We debated whether this was just a trick of the light or some chemical reaction, but deep down, a primal part of my brain screamed that something was profoundly wrong. Our discussion was suddenly cut short by a sharp cry. Muhammad, one of the officers, a man of medium build with a stern face marked by a thick, neatly trimmed beard, and eyes that had seen more than his years would suggest, hurried into the tomb. He was visibly agitated, a stark contrast to his usual composed demeanor. Come quickly, he urged. There's something you need to see. As we followed him, Muhammad recounted the disturbing events of the past few days. All the guard dogs in their camp had mysteriously disappeared without a trace. There had been no barking, no signs of struggle, nothing. The soldiers were deeply unsettled by the incident, but Muhammad had chosen not to inform us to avoid causing any alarm. However, that morning, a new development had forced his hand. A soldier, while conducting a routine perimeter check, had ventured a bit farther than usual for a moment of privacy. It was then that he stumbled upon something horrifying in the bushes. The soldier, pale and shaken, had rushed back to alert the officers. The urgency in Muhammad's voice as he described the scene piqued our interest and filled us with a sense of foreboding. We reached the location, a dense thicket standing tall and imposing. Pushing through the path that had been cleared, we emerged into an open space. The clearing was circular, with the tall grass flattened as if by frequent visits. Dominating the center was a stone altar, stained with dried blood, with cuneiform inscriptions etched into its surface. The sight that greeted us was macabre. The corpses of animals lay scattered around the altar. Dogs, predominantly, but also rats, other small rodents, and a snake, all in various states of decay. Their bodies were desiccated, resembling mummies more than corpses, as if every drop of moisture had been drawn out of them. Muhammad stood beside me, his usual stoicism replaced by a look of dread. My colleagues too shared in the shock, their faces reflecting the horror of the scene. I leaned closer to the altar, squinting at the cuneiform. The writing was chaotic, almost frenzied, with symbols scattered haphazardly across the stone. I could barely make out a few words. Night, tribute, retribution. The implications were chilling. It was clear that whoever had written this possessed a deep understanding of ancient Sumerian script, a knowledge that was rare and typically limited to scholars. I glanced back at my colleagues, their expressions a mix of confusion and disbelief. None of us could fathom engaging in such a bizarre ritual. We spent considerable time examining the site, trying to piece together the puzzle before us. Eventually, we instructed Muhammad to have the soldiers bury the animal corpses. The somber task done, we returned to our excavation, each step heavy with the weight of the morning's discovery. The unsettling events at the altar lingered in our minds, casting a dark shadow over our work. The rest of the day passed in a tense silence, our usual enthusiasm dampened by the unshakable feeling that something unnatural was at play. The following morning, I was roused from a restless sleep by a whisper. It was a soft, almost melodious sound, which felt strangely out of place in the stark, unforgiving desert. I opened my eyes to the isolation of my tent, the sun's rays piercing through the fabric, casting long, distorted shadows. My body felt worn out, the extended duration in the desert visibly taking its toll. I got up with effort and approached the portable wash basin to freshen up. Splashing water on my face, I suddenly heard the whisper again. This time it felt like it was resonating directly in my ears. What the hell is happening? I muttered to myself, questioning whether I was still dreaming. The whispering ceased abruptly, leaving an oppressive silence in its wake. Feeling unsettled, I dressed and made my way to our makeshift kitchen area. There I found my colleagues, James and Professor Dupont. James looked particularly haggard, his eyes sunken, and his face pale, reflecting a similar unease that I felt. Professor Dupont, however, seemed her usual composed self. I shared my experience of the mysterious morning whispers. 
James's reaction was one of surprise. He had experienced the same. Professor Dupont, on the other hand, looked at us with a mixture of concern and disbelief, claiming she had heard nothing. As a man of science, I had always been skeptical of the supernatural, but the recent events were beginning to challenge my rational beliefs. For a fleeting moment, I found myself longing for the comfort of a church, a sanctuary I had never sought before. Our conversation brought some temporary relief, and we hypothesized that the desert's harsh climate or possible gas emissions might be causing auditory hallucinations. As we discussed these possibilities, a semblance of rationality and calmness returned. We concluded our breakfast and resumed our work with a renewed focus, aiming to complete our tasks within the next five days and transport our findings to the local museum. However, the calm was short-lived. Around noon, as I was engrossed in documenting our findings, a sudden commotion and the sound of a gunshot jolted us into action. Leaving our work, we rushed outside, only to witness a shocking scene. Two of our guards were locked in a violent struggle right outside the tomb's entrance. One was bleeding profusely from a wound in his arm, yet they continued to grapple with each other, both shouting, Demon, in a frenzy. We stood there, frozen in shock, unsure how to intervene without endangering ourselves. It wasn't long before other soldiers arrived and managed to separate the two, who were still in a state of uncontrollable rage. The soldiers bound them and took them away from the scene. They were tied to jeeps, and a local medic was summoned to attend to their wounds. Their incoherent, frantic yells added to the already tense atmosphere. The camp was now enveloped in an air of fear. Soldiers whispered among themselves, casting anxious glances towards the tomb. Some were praying fervently, beads in hand, while others sat in stunned silence, unable to comprehend the unfolding events. Officer Muhammad approached us, looking more disturbed than I had ever seen him. He explained that the guards had complained of hearing whispers similar to what James and I had experienced. This revelation sent a chill down my spine. The situation was deteriorating rapidly, with each passing moment adding to the sense of dread. To prevent panic, Officer Muhammad decided to send the two disturbed guards to the city. As they were driven away, I noticed the restlessness among the soldiers intensifying. Some were praying, others simply sat in silence, eyes wide with fear. We tried to focus on our work, hoping to complete our tasks and leave this cursed place as soon as possible. The following day passed without further incident, and we hoped that perhaps the worst was over. However, the next morning, we were rudely awakened by a blood-curdling scream. Leaping out of our tents, we, along with the rest of the camp, rushed towards the source of the commotion. There, in the midst of a gathered crowd, lay a human body, desiccated and mummified like the animal corpses we had previously discovered. The sight of a human being in such a state was deeply disturbing. The sound of retching drew my attention to Professor Dupont, who was visibly shaken and struggling to maintain her composure. Officer Muhammad, kneeling beside the body, looked up with a grave expression. He announced that the deceased was one of his soldiers who had been on night watch. The murmurs of fear among the soldiers grew louder, their faces etched with terror. Officer Muhammad ordered the body to be loaded onto a truck and sent to the city for examination. He then began an investigation into the incident. We returned to our work, but the atmosphere in the camp had shifted irreversibly. By evening, we inquired about the investigation, but Officer Muhammad had nothing to report. The day ended with us retiring to our tents, overwhelmed by fear and uncertainty. The next day, the camp was in disarray. It turned out that the majority of the soldiers had deserted overnight. Officer Muhammad, visibly frustrated, yelled at his remaining subordinates, demanding they uphold their duty. Despite his orders, there was a palpable sense of discontent and fear among them. After a series of heated exchanges, Officer Muhammad drove off in his Jeep, only to return later in the day with a new contingent of about 25 soldiers. With the arrival of fresh faces at the camp, a tenuous calm settled over the once uneasy atmosphere. Despite this, an air of dread lingered, like a silent storm brewing on the horizon. Resuming our work, we tried to shake off the lingering discomfort. The sarcophagus, which had been left close for several days, stood as a grim reminder of recent events. Compelled by a mixture of fear and curiosity, I decided to reopen it. Despite its stone construction, it was not overly heavy. Along with Jason, we cautiously lifted the lid and placed it gently on the ground next to the sarcophagus. As I raised my eyes, 
I caught sight of Professor Dupont's face, etched with a look of deep horror and primal fear. My gaze then shifted to the mummy, and my heart pounded wildly against my chest. James, who had also glimpsed the sight, stumbled backward in terror, falling onto the ground. The body before us appeared as though it had just succumbed to death. It lay motionless, showing no signs of life, yet instead of the desiccated mummy, there was a body covered in fresh, unnaturally black flesh that seemed to emit a ghostly sheen. The raven black hair, dense and lustrous, covered its head and the face. Though as repulsive as ever with its missing nose and protruding fangs, seemed even more terrifying now, less skeletal and more defined. Rooted to the spot, we were fearful of making any sudden movements. The corpse was still, but there was an unnerving feeling that it might spring to life with the slightest provocation. Subconsciously, we moved closer to each other, seeking reassurance in proximity while trying to comprehend the horrifying situation. Fear etched our faces as we shared wordless looks of horror. Finally, I gestured towards the exit, and we hastily left the tomb. Outside, under the relentless desert sun, we gathered to discuss the inexplicable phenomenon. It was becoming increasingly difficult to deny that we were dealing with something beyond the realm of science. Reluctantly, we acknowledged the connection between the attacks and the body in the sarcophagus. The most sensible action would be to seal the tomb, dismantle the camp, and leave. But such a decision would not only discredit us in the scientific community, but also face opposition from authorities eager to claim the unearthed treasures. With heavy hearts, we resolved to continue our work. We accelerated our efforts to transport the artifacts. Those not yet cataloged were left aside for future documentation. Carefully, we moved item after item to the waiting trucks, avoiding letting the soldiers enter the tomb. We were on edge, constantly casting nervous glances back at the mummy. The calm was shattered when Professor Dupont screamed. With tears in her eyes and her hand clapped over her mouth, she pointed tremblingly at the mummy, claiming she saw it twitch a finger. Overcome with fear, she bolted from the tomb, her cries echoing in the desolate landscape. She rushed into her tent, frantically packing her belongings. In disbelief, we followed, trying to understand her reaction. She insisted she could no longer bear the situation and needed to leave immediately. Despite our attempts to dissuade her, she was adamant. Flagging down a passing soldier, she hastily departed in a jeep. James and I exchanged weary, resigned glances, sighing deeply as we returned to our task. As the day progressed and we neared the completion of moving the artifacts, a sudden gust of wind whipped through the camp, signaling the onset of chaos. Officer Muhammad rushed towards us, urgently pointing south. Following his gaze, we were met with the sight of a colossal wall of sand, a sandstorm barreling towards us. Panic ensued as soldiers scrambled to protect equipment and seek shelter. The daylight began to dim under the shadow of the approaching storm, and the wind grew fiercer, howling like a wild beast unleashed. As we finished loading the last of the artifacts, a sense of relief was quickly replaced by a piercing scream from the right. I spun around to see Officer Muhammad, his rifle raised, firing desperately at a horrific sight. The mummy from the tomb, a nightmare come to life, had one of the soldiers in its grasp. The scene was like something out of a horror movie, the creature's mouth attached to the soldier's neck, draining his life away. His body convulsed violently, and his screams were filled with such primal fear that it chilled me to the bone. Officer Muhammad's face was a mask of terror as he continued to fire at the creature, but it seemed impervious to the bullets. After what felt like an eternity, the creature finished its gruesome task and disappeared as quickly as it had appeared, leaving us in a state of shock. Before we could even process what had happened, another scream echoed from the left, followed by more gunshots and the same chilling shrieks of agony. James, wide-eyed with fear, grabbed my arm, urging me to flee. But the sandstorm around us was growing more intense, swallowing the landscape in a haze of sand and reducing visibility to almost zero. We knew we had to move fast. As we made our way to the truck, I felt a sudden sharp pain. I was knocked off my feet, James tumbling down beside me. Looking up through the swirling sand, I saw Malik standing over us, his eyes cold and predatory. These artifacts are not yours to take, he hissed venomously, before he jumped into the driver's seat and sped away with our discoveries. We watched helplessly as the truck disappeared into the storm, 
The camp was now a scene of utter chaos. The air was filled with the sounds of screaming, gunfire, and the howling wind. We had no choice but to run. Pulling James with me, we headed toward the river, our only hope for escape. As we ran, we came across Officer Muhammad, firing blindly into the storm. To our horror, we watched him accidentally shoot one of his own men. The soldier fell to the ground, blood pooling in the sand. The gunshot suddenly stopped and we paused, only to see something round and bloody rolling towards us. A scream escaped my lips as I realized it was the severed head of Officer Muhammad. We resumed our desperate sprint to the river. As we neared the riverbank, a gush of blood erupted in front of us. I turned to see James thrown back, his arm severed. His screams were heart-wrenching. Quickly, fashioning a tourniquet from my shirt, I managed to stem the bleeding and dragged him to the river's edge. We plunged into the fast-flowing water, letting the current carry us away from the nightmare behind us. Eventually, we were washed up on a riverbank, miles away from the camp. James was barely conscious, his face pale from blood loss. I bound his wound as best as I could with the remains of my shirt. After catching our breath, I determined our location and realized we were miles away from the nearest settlement. With no other option, I hoisted James onto my back and began the long, arduous journey through the desert night. The journey to the settlement was harrowing. Every step was a battle against exhaustion and despair. The desert night was eerily silent, a stark contrast to the chaos we had just escaped. As the first light of dawn touched the horizon, the distant lights of the settlement finally came into view. We were on the brink of collapse, but the sight of salvation gave us the last bit of strength we needed. Upon reaching the settlement, James was immediately taken to a medical facility. His life was saved, but the trauma of the night's events lingered. I was left in a state of shock, unable to fully comprehend the horrors we had endured. When military officials arrived, we recounted our story, but our words were met with skepticism. In an effort to validate our account, I suggested they visit the site, though I made it clear that I would never set foot there again. Reluctantly, they agreed to investigate. After several hours, the military returned with grim news. The camp was decimated, the bodies of our colleagues and soldiers scattered amidst the ruins. The artifacts, along with the mummy, were nowhere to be found. The tomb itself was destroyed, its entrance collapsed and inaccessible. The storm had obliterated most traces of what had transpired, leaving more questions than answers. Time passed, and Professor DuPont visited us in the settlement. She had heard about the calamitous events and expressed her relief at having left the site when she did. We discussed the ordeal, each of us struggling to come to terms with the reality of our experience. How could we possibly convey the truth of what happened without sounding like madmen? As James began his slow recovery, we made preparations to leave Iraq. The disbelief that met our story was disheartening. No one seemed to grasp the gravity of what had transpired, nor the danger that might still lurk in the desert sands. The fate of Malik and the creature remained a mystery, their whereabouts unknown. That fateful expedition had irrevocably changed my outlook on life. Once a staunch skeptic, I was now haunted by the knowledge of things beyond the realm of science and reason. Our return journey was marked by a heavy silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts, grappling with the reality that the world was far more mysterious and terrifying than we had ever imagined. Story 3 this terrifying tale unfolded in my childhood, a time when the world seemed vast and mysterious, and my neighborhood was my universe. The courtyard where I played was an oasis of adventure, surrounded by towering apartment blocks that seemed to touch the sky. In the center, a patch of worn grass served as the stage for countless childhood games, a place where laughter and shouts echoed against the concrete walls. One summer day, the sun hung high in the sky, its rays painting everything in a golden hue. The air was filled with the scent of blooming flowers and the distant sound of city life. Exhausted from an intense game of ball, I flopped down on the grass, feeling its prickly texture against my skin. I lay there, catching my breath, watching clouds drift lazily overhead. As I sat up, my gaze inadvertently fell upon the house across the street. It stood in stark contrast to the rest of the neighborhood, an old, dilapidated structure its paint peeling and windows boarded up. It had always intrigued and frightened me in equal measure. The locals called it the ghost house, 
and it was the source of numerous eerie tales that circulated among us kids. It looked like a relic from another era, its once grand facade now a testament to neglect. The house's occupants were an enigma. They were reclusive, never mingling with the rest of us, shrouded in mystery as much as their home. Just as I pondered over them, they emerged from around the corner, a sight so rare it felt like witnessing a legend come to life. The mother led the way. She was a tall, striking woman with long blonde hair that cascaded down her back, shimmering in the sunlight. Her dress, though simple, hung elegantly on her, fluttering slightly with each step she took. There was an air of grace about her, yet her eyes, cold and distant, betrayed no emotion. Trailing behind her was her husband, a stark contrast to her elegance. He was shorter and noticeably rounder, with a lumbering gait that suggested a life of labor. His clothes were plain, and his face bore the marks of a man burdened with heavy thoughts. Bringing up the rear was their son, a young boy with an innocent face that seemed out of place in this odd family. He struggled to keep up with his parents, his small legs moving as fast as they could. His eyes were wide and curious, scanning the world around him with an unspoken eagerness. As they neared their door, a soft thud broke the afternoon's tranquility. My eyes darted towards the sound, and there, lying on the asphalt, was a hand. It wasn't just any hand, it was the boy's, fingers twitching as if they were still alive. The boy looked down at it, not with shock or horror, but with a resigned familiarity. He bent down, his small fingers struggling to reattach it to his wrist. I watched, frozen in disbelief, as he treated it like a mere inconvenience. My mind raced with questions. Was it a prosthetic? But how could it move on its own? My thoughts were interrupted as something even more bizarre happened. The hand didn't seem to fit back properly, and in his frustration, the boy jerked violently. To my utter horror, an eye popped out of its socket, rolling onto the ground like a lost marble. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine, my body paralyzed by the grotesque spectacle. The mother, sensing something amiss, stopped abruptly. She turned, her gaze scanning the scene with a predator's precision. When her eyes met mine, a jolt of fear shot through me. They were the eyes of someone who had seen too much, eyes that held secrets darker than the night. I quickly averted my gaze, my heart pounding in my chest. I sat there motionless, the sound of my heartbeat deafening in my ears. The air felt heavy, charged with an unspoken threat. After what seemed like an eternity, I mustered the courage to look again. They were gone, vanished as if they were mere apparitions. Shaken, I scrambled to my feet, my legs wobbly and unsure. The world around me felt different now, tainted by the unsettling reality of what I had just witnessed. With a surge of primal instinct, I dash at home, the echo of my footsteps a frantic rhythm in the other Wiesesillent street. Once home, I found refuge in its familiarity. My parents were there, symbols of normalcy and safety. I told them everything, my words tumbling out in a torrent of fear and confusion. But to them, it was just a child's overactive imagination, a story too bizarre to be true. The story didn't end there. In the days that followed, an ominous sense of being watched crept over me. It was a feeling I couldn't shake off, a persistent prickle at the back of my neck. The once familiar and comforting surroundings of our neighborhood now seemed to harbor unseen eyes, watching my every move. While playing in the courtyard, I could feel gazes boring into me from the windows of the house across the street. The ghost house, with its boarded windows and peeling paint, now felt more alive, more menacing. It was as if the house itself had eyes, cold and unblinking, observing me with an unsettling intensity. Back in my room, the sense of being watched intensified. Some nights, I would catch fleeting glimpses of a figure lurking in the yard, hiding behind the old oak tree whose branches cast eerie shadows against my window. I would stare into the darkness, trying to make sense of the shape that seemed to vanish the moment I focused on it. The fear was paralyzing, a cold hand gripping my heart. My parents tried to soothe my fears, dismissing them as the product of an overactive imagination. They would tuck me in, their words a balm to my frayed nerves, but the comfort they offered was fleeting. In the darkness of my room, their reassurances felt hollow, drowned out by the pounding of my own heartbeat. One night as I lay in bed, a soft noise broke the silence. It was a subtle scraping sound, like something brushing against the window. 
my heart leapt into my throat. With tentative steps, I approached the window, my hands trembling as I reached for the curtain. The streetlight outside cast a dim glow, creating shadows that danced upon the glass. As I peered out, a face suddenly pressed against the window, its features twisted into a grotesque leer. I screamed, a primal sound of terror that echoed through the house. My parents rushed into my room, their faces etched with concern. They looked out the window, but the face was gone, leaving no trace of its presence. I knew that face. It belonged to our neighbor, a man who had always seemed benign, an unremarkable presence in our daily lives. His sudden transformation into something sinister was both shocking and incomprehensible. I tried to explain, my words tumbling out in a frantic rush, but my parents looked at me with skepticism. Determined to make them believe, I issued a chilling warning. If I ever disappeared, they should look for me in the house across the street. Their expressions shifted from concern to disbelief. They nodded, but their nods were empty gestures, patronizing acknowledgments of a child's fanciful fears. They tucked me into bed, their comforting words doing little to ease the dread that clung to me like a second skin. As they left, the room felt colder, the shadows darker. I lay there, staring at the ceiling, my mind racing with terrifying possibilities. The night was long, filled with half-formed dreams and restless tossing. Every creak of the house, every rustle of the wind against the window sent jolts of fear through me. I imagined eyes watching me from the darkness, the neighbor's twisted face lurking just out of sight. As dawn broke, the fear subsided slightly, the light of day offering a temporary reprieve. But the feeling of being watched never left. It hung over me like a cloud, a constant reminder that something sinister was lurking in the shadows. The days that followed were a blur of unease and paranoia. I avoided the courtyard, no longer finding joy in the games that once brought me happiness. The laughter of other children seemed distant, a reminder of an innocence I felt slipping away. I kept a vigilant watch on the ghost house, half expecting to see something emerge from its decrepit facade. But it remained silent, its secrets hidden behind boarded windows and peeling paint. The neighbor's presence became a source of constant anxiety. I would see him occasionally, going about his daily routine, but now there was an edge of menace to his mundane actions. Every smile, every wave, felt like a veiled threat. I wondered if my parents had spoken to him, if they had voiced their concerns, but the normalcy of their interactions with him suggested otherwise. My room, once a haven, now felt like a prison. I would lie awake at night, listening to the sounds of the house, each one magnifying my fear. The tree outside my window with its gnarled branches seemed to come alive in the darkness, its silhouette like twisted hands reaching for me. I awoke abruptly, jolted from slumber by the clanging of plates and a hum of conversation. As my eyes flickered open, confusion enveloped me. I found myself seated on a wooden chair in a kitchen, its once cheerful yellow walls now peeling, revealing the decay beneath. The air was thick with the scent of something metallic mixed with the mustiness of neglect. My body and legs were tightly bound, the ropes biting into my flesh, yet my arms remained strangely free. Around me three figures huddled, my neighbors. The woman among us, her eyes wide with terror, met my gaze and shook her head subtly, warning me to remain silent. She thrust a plate towards me, filled with what appeared to be human eyes, their vacant stares a grotesque testament to the madness that surrounded us. The nauseating sight sent bile rising in my throat. Across from me, a man and his wife continued their meal, indifferent to my horror. Their faces, gaunt and expressionless, seemed detached from the grim reality of their actions. A gentle nudge at my side drew my attention away from the horrific feast. Turning, I found myself face to face with a boy, no older than ten. His head was bowed, his hands trembling as he offered me a moldy, stale donut. His eyes, brimming with silent despair, conveyed a depth of suffering that words could never capture. He stood, a small, defiant figure in the face of overwhelming terror, offering the only comfort he could muster. But this fleeting moment of humanity was shattered as the woman noticed our exchange. With a speed that belied her size, she lunged at us, her face twisted in rage. 
In one swift motion, she untied me and dragged me out of the kitchen, her grip iron tight and unyielding. We entered an adjacent room, a space that once served as a laboratory. It was a chaotic mess of dusty shelves lined with vials, beakers, and jars, each containing substances of unknown origin. The air was heavy with the smell of chemicals, creating a suffocating atmosphere that made it hard to breathe. The woman, her demeanor now eerily calm, pulled me towards a cabinet and retrieved a flask filled with a bright red liquid. She spoke with a disturbing conviction, promising eternal youth and a twisted form of motherhood if I drank the concoction. She extended the flask towards me, her eyes alight with a mad fervor. My heart pounded in my chest as I resisted, my entire body rebelling against the insanity of her request. I kicked and struggled, but my efforts were in vain. The floor was cold and unyielding beneath me, each movement sending jolts of pain through my bound limbs. Her husband, previously a silent spectator, now joined in, his massive hands pinning me down with a strength that felt inhuman. The woman approached, the open flask in hand, its contents inches from my lips. In that moment of utter despair, the boy acted. With a courage that belied his fragile frame, he lunged forward, shattering the flask against the floor. The liquid spilled out, its bright hue disappearing as it soaked into the cracked tiles. The woman's scream of rage was deafening, echoing off the walls of the claustrophobic room. The boy, seizing the moment of distraction, bolted out of the room. She moved to pursue him, but her path was blocked as police officers burst into the room, their shouts commanding everyone to freeze. Chaos ensued as the woman and man lunged at the officers, who responded with gunfire. I scrambled for cover, finding refuge under a heavy wooden table. The gunshots ceased, replaced by the heavy breathing of the officers and the whimpering of my neighbors. A pair of hands gently lifted me from my hiding spot. It was a policeman, his face a mask of concern and determination. He carried me out of that house of horrors into the safety of the night. The cool air outside was a balm to my senses, the starry sky a welcome sight after the oppressive darkness of the lab. Reunited with my parents, I clung to them, their familiar warmth a stark contrast to the cold cruelty I had just escaped. Yet amidst the relief, a nagging thought lingered. The boy, my unlikely savior, was nowhere to be found. Despite the chaos of the raid, he had vanished, his fate as mysterious as his presence in that dreadful place. In the days that followed, I asked about him but he remained a ghost, a fleeting shadow in the night. His bravery, his sacrifice haunted me. He had saved me, yet in doing so, had disappeared into the ether, a lost soul in a world that had shown him little kindness. Story 4 As the first rays of the morning sun broke through the thick crowns of the towering trees, a transformation began. The vast expanse of ancient forest stirred under the cold breath of dawn. The mist, ethereal and ghostly, began its slow dance over the ground. It crept with the patience of time, a white spirit weaving its light blanket over the earth. This mist, seemingly sentient, found its way through every nook, cradling each bush, tree, and blade of grass in its chilly embrace. In this early hour, the air held a peculiar transparency, a crystal clarity that magnified the world's dormant beauty. Every inhalation brought with it an icy freshness, a sharp reminder of the world's awakening. The ground, hardened by the kiss of frost, offered resistance underfoot. Each step crunched through the fresh snow, a sound akin to ancient parchment being carefully unfolded, revealing secrets long hidden. This was no solitary journey. The steady, rhythmic footsteps of people moving through the forest broke the sanctity of the morning, an intrusion of human existence into the natural symphony. Their breaths, visible in the frosty air, created ephemeral clouds that vanished as quickly as they appeared, a fleeting testament to their presence in this untouched world. Around them, the forest was a kingdom of frost. The landscape, draped in a layer of frozen dew, glistened and shimmered in the sun's embrace. Each ray of light, filtering through the canopy, transformed the ice into countless gems, a treasure trove scattered indiscriminately by some generous, unseen hand. As the group ventured deeper, the forest's character shifted. The snow-laden branches of the trees bent gracefully under their burden, forming natural arches and tunnels. 
Sunlight, in its quest to touch the Earth, broke through these formations, scattering the fog and revealing the forest's hidden depths. Amidst this serene backdrop, a moment of discord arose. One of the men halted, his hand outstretched, pointing ahead. Through the thinning veil of fog, a disturbing tableau slowly came into focus. At the base of a majestic tree, whose roots delved deep into the frozen earth, lay a body. A man, his clothes in tatters, his skin marred and bloody. His stillness was unsettling, a stark contrast to the life that surrounded him. The air itself seemed to recoil from the scent of death that lingered, an unspoken truth hanging heavily. Approaching cautiously, the group moved closer, their presence a reluctant disturbance to the scene's eerie calm. The man's body was a testament to a violent end, the final chapter of his story, written in the language of struggle. Around him, scattered possessions lay strewn, remnants of a life abruptly severed. His face, locked in an expression of horror, seemed to gaze upon an unseen terror, a secret held in his eternal silence. The silence that followed was not just an absence of sound, but a weight that pressed upon each member of the group. It was a silence filled with unspoken questions, with the ghost of a story yet untold. As the young park ranger, Chris, crossed the threshold of the small, seemingly dormant town, his gaze meandered through the picturesque landscape that lay before him. The houses, quaint and unassuming, were scattered like forgotten toys among the undulating hills, their roofs adorned with a delicate frosting of snow. The town, basking in the early morning sun, was a living tableau of tranquility, reminiscent of countless other small towns nestled in the bosom of dense forests and looming mountains. The streets, narrow and serpentine, ran through the heart of the city, surrounded by ancient buildings. Each corner held a stoic silence, as if time itself had paused to admire the scene. It was a stark contrast to the bustling cities where life moved at a breakneck speed. Here, in this secluded haven, time seemed to saunter leisurely. Chris, stepping into the shoes of his predecessor who had met a tragic end in an encounter with a predatory animal, carried with him a mixture of youthful arrogance and naivete. He was unaware of the full extent of the danger that had claimed his predecessor's life and harbored a quiet confidence in his ability to avoid a similar fate. His first order of business, as he set foot in this new chapter of his life, was to acquaint himself with the town and its inhabitants. As he strolled through the streets, his eyes studied the faces of the locals. They were the faces of simplicity and hard work, etched with lines that spoke of a life of toil and contentment. Their measured lives seemed to flow in a rhythm as old as the hills that cradled the town. The town, however, did harbor one peculiarity, or rather one peculiar inhabitant. In the local bar where conversations flowed as freely as the drinks, Chris learned of an eccentric old woman, known among the townsfolk as Crazy Grandma. She was a figure shrouded in mystery, an enigma that walked the streets, her presence weaving in and out of the everyday tapestry of the town. Her attire was a throwback to a bygone era, her clothes an eclectic mix of outdated fashions that hung loosely on her frail frame. Her hair, a tangled web of gray and white, framed a face that was as much a part of the town's landscape as the ancient buildings themselves. She was often seen wandering aimlessly, mumbling to herself in a language that seemed to belong to another time. The locals, accustomed to her presence, had warned Chris to pay her no mind. They spoke of her with a mix of dismissal and caution, as if she were a harmless relic of the past that was best left undisturbed. Chris was assigned a modest cabin nestled near the edge of an expansive forest. The house, seasoned by time possessed a simple charm, its cozy interior, a welcoming contrast to the sprawling woods beyond. Settling in took several days, during which Chris became fully familiar with the town and its people. Soon after, he embarked on his journey as a full-time ranger. As dawn broke, Chris commenced his duties. The forest, blanketed in snow, lay before him, a realm awaiting his careful stewardship. He dressed warmly, each layer a necessary shield against the winter's chill, and set out with steady strides, his boots imprinting a solitary trail in the untouched snow. His daily patrol was an exercise in vigilance and patience. Chris's eyes, trained to discern the subtlest of signs, scanned the landscape. The deer trails, mere indentations in the snow, spoke of the forest's inhabitants and their nocturnal wanderings. 
The distant calls of birds, muffled by the dense canopy, provided a natural soundtrack to his expedition. Part of his role entailed monitoring the well-being of the wildlife. The forest's denizens, from the smallest bird to the most elusive mammal, were under his watchful eye. He also surveyed the trails, now obscured by snow, for signs of wear or obstruction, ensuring they remained passable and safe. The trees, too, were his concern. Chris inspected their trunks and branches, looking for any signs of disease or damage. His hands, though encased in gloves, worked with precision, clearing snow-laden branches and checking the health of each tree. Midday found Chris in a sunlit clearing, where he paused to record his observations. His notes were meticulous, a written testament to the day's findings. He then moved on to a frozen stream, its surface a solid sheet of ice. Testing its thickness was critical, a precaution for any who might venture across. His lunch was a brief affair, taken in the quiet solitude of the forest. Even as he ate, his senses remained attuned to the woods around him. The winter forest was not a place for complacency. As he walked along one of the paths, something unusual caught his attention. A multitude of footprints, unusual and out of place against the usual tracks left by forest dwellers. These footprints, oddly shaped and spaced, didn't resemble any animal he knew. Intrigued but cautious, Chris made a mental note to revisit this anomaly. His training had taught him the importance of careful observation before action. However, his plans for a thorough investigation were abruptly interrupted. A group of hikers, their faces etched with concern and fear, approached him. They spoke of a grisly discovery deep in the woods, a dead animal, but not just any animal. The description they gave was of a creature so brutally mutilated that it barely resembled anything from the natural world. Abandoning his usual patrol route, Chris followed the hikers to the location of their disturbing find. The sight that greeted him was macabre, to say the least. There, in a small clearing, lay the remains of a deer. But it was no ordinary death by predation. The deer's body was dismembered, its parts strewn about with a seeming disregard for nature's order. The blood, or what should have been there, was conspicuously absent as if drained completely. Chris surveyed the scene with a meticulous eye, his mind racing to piece together what had happened. The usual telltale signs of an animal attack were missing. No tracks of a predator, no signs of a struggle. It was as if the deer had been placed there, its end coming not from the natural world but from a much more sinister source. The more he examined the scene, the more Kreese felt a chilling realization creep upon him. The possibility that this was the work of a human loomed large in his mind. The methodical, almost surgical manner in which the deer had been dismembered suggested a level of planning and intent that was deeply unsettling. Yet, in his heart, Chris knew that jumping to conclusions without evidence was not the mark of a good ranger or a good detective. The forest had many secrets, some revealed only to those who were patient and observant. The night had draped itself over the ranger's cabin, a cloak of darkness punctuated only by the occasional hoot of an owl or the rustle of leaves. It was this nocturnal stillness that made the sudden, strange sounds even more jarring to Chris. Awakened from a restless slumber, his senses immediately sharpened, attuned to the alien noises that encroached upon the sanctity of his rest. The footsteps were odd, uneven, and deliberate, pacing around the cabin in an unhurried rhythm. With cautious movements, Chris parted the curtains, his eyes straining to make sense of the shapes in the darkness. At first glance, the silhouettes appeared almost human, but as his eyes adjusted, a chilling realization dawned upon him. The figures bore horns, their forms more animal than man, casting bizarre, distorted shadows against the moonlit backdrop. His mind raced with possibilities. Wild animals, perhaps, straying closer to human habitation than usual. Something about their outlines seemed off, their movements not quite fitting the natural gait of woodland creatures. Opting for caution, Chris chose to remain within the safety of his cabin, hoping the strange visitors would soon lose interest and retreat into the forest. But the night unfolded differently. The creatures, whatever they were, continued their eerie promenade around his home, their actions almost ritualistic in nature. It was as if they were performing some arcane ceremony, their slow, deliberate steps a dance to a rhythm only they could hear. As dawn broke, 
the strange symphony ceased, leaving Chris fatigued and unnerved. The morning light brought a semblance of normalcy, but the echoes of the night's oddities lingered in his mind. Seeking a distraction and the comforting routine of daily chores, he ventured to the local store for groceries. The store, a hub of the small community, was a place where news traveled fast and tales, both tall and true, were exchanged. Sharing his nocturnal experience with the store owner, Chris hoped for some insight, perhaps an explanation rooted in the natural world he was so familiar with. The owner, however, dismissed his words with a smile, saying that the gamekeeper, as a connoisseur of nature, should know better the habits of animals. Yet it was not the store owner's words that unsettled Chris, but the gaze of the man's seven-year-old son. The boy's eyes held a cold, predatory quality, his smile enigmatic and unnerving. There was a depth to his stare that seemed uncharacteristic for one so young, a knowingness that sent a shiver down Chris's spine. Despite the unease that this brief interaction sparked, Chris tried to brush it off. He reminded himself that the imagination of a man who spends his days and nights in the vast, often mysterious wilderness, can sometimes play tricks on him. Focusing on the tangible tasks of his role as a ranger, he endeavored to put the strangeness of the past night and the disconcerting encounter at the store out of his mind. Two days had elapsed since the peculiar occurrences that had disturbed the ranger's nocturnal peace. The normalcy of his daily patrols had offered a brief respite, a chance to ascribe the events to the overactive imagination of a solitary man in the vast wilderness. However, this fragile semblance of order was about to be shattered. On a routine patrol, Chris stumbled upon a scene that violently jerked him back to the realm of the unexplained. At the forest's edge, hidden among the undergrowth, lay the lifeless form of a cow. It was a sight gruesomely familiar. The animal's body was mutilated, its innards removed with a precision that defied natural predators, and like the deer before, drained of blood. The discovery cemented Chris's growing suspicion that these were not isolated incidents. An unnerving pattern was emerging, one that pointed to a sinister presence in the forest. Determined to seek answers, he headed to the local sheriff's office, a bastion of law in the small community. The sheriff, a seasoned man of the law, listened as Chris recounted his findings. In response, he brought up past incidents, particularly a case involving a group of students arrested for animal cruelty years ago. He suggested that the recent events might be the work of tourists engaging in macabre pranks, a theory that did little to alleviate Chris's concerns. His intuition told him that something more malevolent was at play. The methodical nature of the mutilations, the deliberate removal of blood, these were not the hallmarks of mere pranks. Leaving the sheriff's office with more questions than answers, Chris stopped to refuel his car, his mind a whirlpool of thoughts. It was there, at the gas station, that he encountered her, the crazy grandmother. She emerged from the shadows like a specter, her presence as unsettling as it was unexpected. Her words, cryptic and chilling, echoed in the silent space between them. On the eighth day, on the eighth moon, the eighth victim must be a young soul, and then the master of eternal life will awaken. The words hung in the air, a riddle wrapped in madness. For a moment, Chris was taken aback, his rational mind grappling with the absurdity of her statement. Yet. Recalling the locals' advice to pay her no heed, he dismissed her words as the ramblings of a disturbed mind. But deep down, a seed of doubt was planted, watered by the inexplicable events he had been witnessing. His drive back home was a journey through his own tumultuous thoughts. The recent events, the mutilated animals, the old woman's enigmatic words, all swirled in his mind, forming a tapestry of darkness that he could not yet fully comprehend. In the days that followed, a deceptive calm settled over the park. The ranger, Chris, went about his daily rounds, the forest seemingly returning to its natural order. No more disturbing finds marred the tranquility of the woods, leading him to hope, albeit cautiously, that the eerie events had come to an end. However, this semblance of normalcy was shattered during one of his deep forest patrols. There, in a clearing that rarely saw human presence, lay a sight that reignited his worst fears. A bear, its massive form a testament to the might of nature, lay torn and lifeless. Like the animals before it, the bear's body was a grotesque display of savagery, its flesh ripped open, the blood eerily absent. 
This grim discovery eradicated any notion that the previous incidents were mere pranks by hikers. The scale and ferocity of this act spoke of something far more sinister, something that transcended the bounds of normal forest predations. With a heavy heart and a mind swirling with dark thoughts, Chris sought out the sheriff once more. Their conversation was a gravely serious exchange of fears and suspicions. Chris expressed his growing alarm, convinced that they were dealing with a threat both unusual and extremely dangerous. In response to this escalating crisis, they resolved to conduct a comprehensive survey of the forest. Their search was meticulous, covering the dense underbrush, the towering trees, and the hidden nooks that only the most experienced of rangers and lawmen knew. It was in one such secluded area that they stumbled upon a discovery that sent chills down their spines. Hidden away from the well-trodden paths, they found a small pit. Around it lay the remains of various animals, their carcasses forming a grim circle. The site resembled a macabre altar, a place of dark and unholy rites. Animal bones were strewn haphazardly, their broken forms telling tales of unspeakable acts. Bloody hides, marked with strange symbols, hung from the trees like ghastly banners. The symbols were unfamiliar, arcane in appearance, and seemed to throb with an ominous intent. The pit itself was a gaping maw in the earth, its interior stained a deep purple black. The discoloration suggested that it had held a considerable quantity of blood, a reservoir for whatever sinister purpose this place served. This harrowing sight only deepened the ranger's sense of horror and bewilderment. He stood there, alongside the sheriff, feeling a creeping dread. It dawned on him that they were facing something that lay beyond the scope of their normal experience and knowledge. This was not the work of a mere predator or a group of misguided youths. This was something other something that whispered of ancient and malevolent secrets. The ghastly discovery in the forest had left the ranger, Chris, in a state of deep anxiety and bewilderment. Standing beside the sheriff in the ominous silence of the woods, he couldn't help but voice his darkest fears. The scene before them, he suggested, bore the hallmarks of a sinister ritual or sacrifice, something far removed from the ordinary crimes they were used to handling. The sheriff, a man seasoned by years of law enforcement in this seemingly peaceful town, listened intently. He acknowledged Chris's concerns but was quick to remind him of the town's long-standing reputation for peace and order. The possibility that locals could be involved in such heinous acts seemed remote to him. Yet the evidence was hard to dismiss, and the sheriff agreed that further investigation was necessary. As they made their way back from the dense cover of the forest, the sheriff attempted to assuage Chris's growing apprehensions. He promised a thorough investigation into these disturbing events, though he admitted that the answers were not readily apparent. In the following days, the ranger dedicated himself to scouring the forest for more clues. His patrols became longer, his eyes searching every nook and cranny of the vast wilderness, but each effort seemed to lead nowhere. His conversations with the sheriff offered little in the way of comfort. The investigation was ongoing but progress was painfully slow. The lack of leads, the absence of suspects, and the mysterious nature of the crimes left them grasping at straws. Then, one night, as Chris gazed up at the sky, he saw it, a moon as red as blood, hanging low over the horizon. Its crimson hue cast a surreal glow over the forest, bathing the trees in a sinister light. This celestial phenomenon, occurring amidst the already troubling events, only served to heighten his anxiety. The sight of the blood-red moon stirred a tumult of emotions within him, fear, powerlessness, and a deep sense of unease. The very fabric of the life he knew seemed to unravel before his eyes. The mystery of the forest, the unexplained deaths, and now this ominous sign in the sky, all conspired to shake his resolve. Faced with these overwhelming circumstances, Chris found himself contemplating a decision he never thought he would consider. The thought of leaving the forest, the very place he had come to protect and cherish, now seemed like a viable option. The town, with its dark secrets and unsolved mysteries, felt increasingly oppressive. The ranger, Chris, burdened by the weight of recent events, made a decisive call to his superiors. He detailed the alarming discoveries, the dismembered animals, the mysterious blood-filled hole, the unsettling atmosphere that now hung over the forest. 
His voice, steady but tinged with an undeniable urgency, conveyed the gravity of the situation. His superior's response, however, was not what Chris had anticipated. In a tone heavy with gravitas, he divulged a chilling piece of information. The ranger who preceded Chris had met his end in these very woods, under circumstances eerily similar to the ones now unfolding. This revelation struck Chris like a physical blow, the words reverberating in his mind like a sinister echo from a forgotten nightmare. Shaken to his core, Chris found himself requesting a transfer, a decision that felt both cowardly and prudent in equal measure. His supervisor, understanding yet firm, agreed to the request but asked for a brief delay. Reluctantly, Chris acquiesced, a sense of duty wrestling with his desire for escape. The next day found him in the local store, a place that had become a familiar refuge amidst the chaos. The shopkeeper, a friendly face in a sea of uncertainties, engaged him in conversation. When Chris mentioned his plans to leave, the reaction was one of genuine surprise and sadness. The shopkeeper spoke of how the townspeople had warmed to Chris, seeing in him not just a guardian of the forest, but a potential friend and ally. Chris, touched by this sentiment, promised to return someday, though the words felt hollow even as they left his lips. Exiting the store, he noticed the shopkeeper's young son playing outside. The boy, previously a source of unease for Chris, was engrossed in a game with his ball. Attempting to cast aside his reservations, Chris offered a friendly smile and greeted the boy. In response, the child paused, looked up, and with an impish grin, displayed the number eight with his fingers before running off with a loud, carefree laugh. This simple gesture, innocent though it may have seemed, sent a ripple of disquiet through Chris. The number eight, a recurring motif in the strange events and cryptic messages he had encountered, now seemed to mock him from the lips of a child. With a mind swirling with questions and a heart heavy with unspoken fears, Chris made his way back to his cabin. The drive was a solitary journey through a landscape that felt both familiar and alien. The trees, the winding paths, the very air he breathed, all seemed to whisper secrets he could not decipher. As he parked his car and stepped out, the quiet of the forest enveloped him. The ranger stood there, a lone figure caught between the life he knew and a mystery that seemed to grow deeper with each passing day. The decision to leave, once a distant thought, now loomed large in his mind. A possible escape from a reality that had become too strange, too menacing. That night, as a silvery moon climbed its way into the star-studded canvas of the sky, the ranger, Chris, lay restless in his cabin. His attempts to find solace in the sanctuary of sleep were futile. Chris lay in his bed, his eyes wide open, staring at the wooden ceiling of his cabin. Each creak of the timbers, each whisper of the wind against the window panes, seemed to speak of the mysteries and anxieties that had enveloped his life in recent weeks. His thoughts wandered through the maze of recent events. The mutilated animals, the blood-filled pit, the cryptic words of the crazy grandmother, and the boy's unnerving gesture. Each memory was a puzzle piece that refused to fit, creating a picture that was increasingly disturbing and incomprehensible. As the hours crawled by, a familiar sense of restlessness took hold of Chris. He rose from his bed, the sheets falling away like the remnants of a forgotten dream. He moved to the window, his hands gripping the sill as he peered into the night. The moon hung low, a celestial orb casting its pale, ethereal glow over the forest. It was then that the sounds began, the soft, yet distinct footsteps, the faint rustle of movement outside his cabin. As if on cue, the familiar, unsettling noises returned, the soft, deliberate footsteps the ghostly silhouettes of horned creatures dancing in the moonlight. But this time, exhausted and irritated after recent events, Chris decides to disperse the animals from the property. Moving with purpose, Chris retrieved his shotgun from its place on the wall. The weight of the gun in his hands was both a comfort and a reminder of the potential danger that lay ahead. He dressed quickly, donning his jacket and boots, his movements methodical, driven by a newfound resolve. Stepping outside, the cool night air greeted him, a stark contrast to the warmth of the cabin. He scanned the surroundings, his eyes trying to penetrate the darkness that hugged the edges of the moonlit clearing. But as he ventured further, a profound silence enveloped the area. The footsteps ceased abruptly, the sense of being watched intensified. 
yet there was no sign of the creatures. Chris circled the cabin, his senses on high alert, searching for any movement, any indication of the presence he felt lurking just beyond sight. The normal nocturnal chorus of the forest seemed muted, as if the creatures of the night too sensed the abnormality of the situation. This oppressive quiet, this absence of life, only heightened Chris's sense of dread. Realizing the abnormality of the situation, the ranger decides to return to the cabin. As he made his way back to the cabin, a sudden, excruciating pain exploded at the back of his head. It was swift and disorienting, a force that sent him reeling. The ground rushed up to meet him, the sky and trees swirling in a dizzying dance. In that fleeting moment of consciousness, he saw it, a figure towering over him, a grotesque parody of man and beast, its eyes reflecting the moonlight with a malevolent gleam. Then, darkness swept over him, a thick, suffocating blanket of unconsciousness. He lay there, vulnerable and exposed, at the mercy of the mysterious figure that had emerged from the night. Consciousness returned to Chris slowly, a creeping awareness that dragged him out of the depths of darkness. His head throbbed with a pulsating pain, a relentless drumbeat that echoed through his skull. He tried to move, but his limbs refused to obey, stretched out and bound in an unnatural pose that sent waves of panic through his foggy mind. His eyes flickered open, adjusting to the dim light that filtered through the dense canopy of trees. The sight that greeted him was one of horror, a tableau so macabre and surreal that for a moment he wondered if he was still ensnared in the clutches of a nightmare. But the cold, hard reality soon set in, anchoring him to a terrifying present. He was suspended over a pit, vast and ominous, its depths filled with a substance that shimmered darkly under the moonlight. It was blood, he realized with a sickening lurch in his stomach, a pool of crimson that seemed to absorb the very light around it. In the center of this gruesome scene lay a human body, desiccated and discolored, resembling more a mummy than a once living being. Its arms were crossed over its chest in a pose that spoke of ancient rituals and forgotten rites. The eyes were closed, the face serene yet haunting, a silent guardian of this unholy sanctuary. Chris's own position mirrored the form of crucifixion, his arms and legs stretched out and bound to the surrounding trees. He could feel the tightness of the ropes cutting into his skin, the vulnerability of his exposed and half-undressed body. On his torso, painted with a substance he dared not identify, was a symbol mysterious and sinister, its lines and curves unfamiliar. All around him, the forest seemed to close in, the trees like silent witnesses to the dark ceremony unfolding beneath their boughs. Animal skins, marked with the same strange symbols that adorned his body, hung from the branches, swaying gently in the night breeze. They formed a macabre tapestry, a backdrop to the ritual that had ensnared him. His mind raced, trying to piece together the events that had led him here. The last thing he remembered was the goat-headed figure, the blow to his head and then nothing but darkness. Now he found himself the centerpiece of a scene that seemed ripped from the pages of a dark, forgotten lore. Fear gripped him, a primal, all-consuming terror that threatened to overwhelm his senses. He was alone, helpless, a pawn in a game whose rules and players were unknown to him. The pain in his head, the tightness of his bonds, the chilling sight of the blood-filled pit, all of it felt like a descent into madness. But beneath the fear, a spark of defiance flickered. As he hung there, suspended between earth and sky, Chris forced himself to take stock of his surroundings. He needed to understand, to observe, to plan. His training had taught him the value of observation, the need to see beyond the immediate terror and discern the details that could mean the difference between life and death. The mummy-like figure in the pit, the symbols on the skins and his body, the arrangement of the sight, all of it was part of a narrative that he needed to understand. Who had brought him here? What was the purpose of this ritual? And most importantly, how could he escape this nightmare? The darkness around him began to stir, giving way to a procession of figures that emerged from the shadows, like phantoms materializing from another realm. They advanced in a formation that was both methodical and eerie, each step deliberate, resonating with a purpose that Chris could neither comprehend nor escape. In their hands, they held wooden sticks, 
each twisted and contorted into symbols that seemed to defy the natural order of wood. As these figures encircled Chris and the altar, the moonlight revealed their visages, human faces obscured by animal masks, some adorned with horns and others with features so grotesque that they seemed to belong more to nightmare than to nature. Their eyes, visible through the masks, burned with an intensity that was both human and otherworldly. The ranger's heart pounded in his chest, each beat a drum of primal fear and disbelief. These were the same creatures he had seen near his cabin, the shadows that had haunted his nights and fueled his fears. Now, they moved around him in a ritual dance, their bodies swaying to a rhythm that was felt rather than heard, their voices chanting in a language that was as incomprehensible as it was chilling. Then, from the midst of this macabre assembly, one figure stepped forward. The man removed his goat mask, revealing a face that struck Chris with a horror far greater than the mask itself. It was the sheriff, his features twisted in an expression that bore no trace of the man Chris had known. The revelation was a blow more devastating than any physical wound, a betrayal that cut to the very core of his being. Panic surged through Chris as he struggled against his bonds, the ropes biting into his flesh with each futile attempt to free himself. But his efforts were in vain. He was ensnared, both physically and within the web of a ritual that was as old as it was sinister. The sheriff, now a figure of dread and authority, approached Chris with a knife in hand. The blade glinted in the moonlight, a harbinger of pain and violence. With a swift, deliberate motion, the sheriff plunged the knife into Chris's side, just under the ribs. A searing pain exploded within him, a fiery agony that spread through his body like wildfire. Blood, warm and profuse, began to flow from the wound, joining the other offerings that soaked the altar. Chris's vision blurred, the figures around him merging into a swirling vortex of masks, symbols, and shadows. The chant of the masked figures grew louder, their voices melding into a cacophony that seemed to resonate with the very earth beneath them. In this moment of excruciating pain and utter helplessness, Chris realized the full extent of his plight. He was the centerpiece of a ritual that was as much a part of this forest as the trees and the soil, a ritual that spoke of a darkness that lay hidden beneath the veneer of the town's tranquility. He was number eight, a young soul, a young victim. As the ritual reached its crescendo, the figures around him seemed to grow in intensity, their dance more frenetic, their chants more fervent. The forest itself seemed to respond, the wind picking up, the trees swaying as if in rhythm with the dark ceremony. Chris, his consciousness ebbing away under the assault of pain and loss, could only watch in horror and disbelief as the ritual unfolded around him. The sheriff, now a priest of this ancient and unholy rite, stood over him, a figure of power and terror. The pain from the knife wound was a searing, unrelenting torment, a physical manifestation of the betrayal and horror that surrounded him. With a voice strained by agony and disbelief, he managed to utter a question to the sheriff, the man he had once considered an ally, a protector of the town's peace. For what? What did I do to deserve this? He gasped, each word a laborious effort. The sheriff, his face a mask of cold detachment, smiled. A chilling echo of the sinister grin Chris had seen on the shopkeeper's son. Being you is bliss, he said, his voice devoid of empathy. With these cryptic words, he plunged the knife into Chris again, twisting it with a cruel precision. As the ranger's vision blurred, his life force ebbing away, he witnessed a scene that would have been dismissed as a fevered hallucination under any other circumstances. The mummified corpse in the pit, an ancient relic of a forgotten time, began to stir. Its eyes snapped open, glowing with an unholy light, as it slowly, purposefully, rose from its resting place. Illuminated by the moon's ghastly hue, the corpse transformed before Chris's fading eyes. It shed its desiccated skin, morphing into a monstrous entity, a being that defied the laws of nature and life. Its form was grotesque, a nightmarish fusion of human and otherworldly features, its eyes burning with a malevolent intelligence. As this abomination began to drink the blood that pooled beneath Chris, the sheriff fell to his knees, his voice rising in a fervent prayer. Master of eternal life, our Lord, grant us enlightenment, he intoned, his words a reverent offering to the creature that now held dominion over them. These moments, 
unfolding in a tableau of mysticism and horror, were the last that Chris would witness. His consciousness slipped away, leaving him in a limbo between the world he knew and a realm of ancient dark secrets. The pain, the fear, the betrayal, all faded into the shadows of oblivion. The ritual reached its zenith, the forest echoing with the chants of the masked figures and the whispers of the trees. The creature, now fully risen, towered over the scene, a symbol of power and terror that had been awakened by the blood and faith of its followers. The sheriff, along with the others, looked on with a mix of awe and fervor. They were disciples of a forgotten god, practitioners of rites that hearkened back to a time when the line between man and myth was blurred. Their actions were not born of madness, but of a belief in a power that transcended the mundane reality of their existence. As the ritual concluded, the creature turned its gaze upon the assembled crowd, its eyes reflecting the blood-red moon. As the first rays of the morning sun broke through the thick crowns of the towering trees, a transformation began. The vast expanse of ancient forest stirred under the cold breath of dawn. The mist, ethereal and ghostly, began its slow dance over the ground. It crept with the patience of time, a white spirit weaving its light blanket over the earth. This mist, seemingly sentient, found its way through every nook, cradling each bush, tree, and blade of grass in its chilly embrace. The ground, hardened by the kiss of frost, offered resistance underfoot. Each step crunched through the fresh snow, a sound akin to ancient parchment being carefully unfolded, revealing secrets long hidden. This was no solitary journey. The steady, rhythmic footsteps of people moving through the forest broke the sanctity of the morning, an intrusion of human existence into the natural symphony. It was a group of police officers and FBI agents. For two weeks, they tackled a confusing and disturbing investigation, the mass disappearance of town residents, including the sheriff, a young park ranger, and numerous residents, both young and old. The case was as baffling as it was distressing. The sudden vanishing of these individuals, without a trace or a clue, had sent ripples of unease and fear through the community and beyond. The police and federal agents were at a loss. Theories abounded, ranging from an orchestrated abduction to a mass exodus, orchestrated for reasons unknown, yet none held up under scrutiny. The absence of concrete evidence or leads only deepened the mystery. Teams of officers, accompanied by canine units, combed through the dense forest, their movements meticulous and systematic. They scoured every inch, from the underbrush to the tree lines, hoping to uncover any sign of the missing persons. But the forest, with its towering trees and sprawling undergrowth, seemed to guard its secrets jealously. Each search yielded no results, the woods remaining silent witnesses to a mystery that was as confounding as it was worrying. As the group ventured deeper, the forest's character shifted. The snow-laden branches of the trees bent gracefully under their burden, forming natural arches and tunnels. Sunlight, in its quest to touch the earth, broke through these formations, scattering the fog and revealing the forest's hidden depths. In the midst of this serene atmosphere there came a moment of discord. One of the policemen stopped with his arm outstretched, pointing forward. A disturbing picture slowly emerged through the thinning mist. At the base of a majestic tree, its roots deeply embedded in the frozen ground, lay a body. A man. His clothes were in tatters and his skin was disfigured and bloody. The group cautiously moved closer, not wanting to disturb the eerie calm of the scene. The man's body showed evidence of a violent end, his stomach had been ripped open and he looked like a mummy. Scattered around him were the remnants of a life suddenly cut short. His face, frozen in an expression of horror, seemed to stare at an unseen terror, a secret kept in its eternal silence. It was Chris, the young ranger who had been victim number eight. Story 5 The city had always been my sanctuary, a sprawling labyrinth where anonymity wasn't just a possibility, but a guarantee. Skyscrapers stretched towards the heavens like concrete titans, each one a testament to human ingenuity and ambition. The unceasing hum of traffic and distant sirens were my lullabies, and the neon glow of billboards and streetlights, my stars. But now, as I sat behind the wheel of my aging sedan, the only lights guiding me were the dim headlights cutting through an ocean of darkness. The assignment from the paper seemed straightforward enough, cover the local festival of a small town. A slice of Americana, 
my editor had said, his voice crackling over the phone. The drive was monotonous, a seemingly endless parade of twists and turns, flanked by an impenetrable wall of trees. Their branches swayed gently in the evening breeze, casting ghostly shadows on the road. The world beyond the city had always seemed alien to me, and this was no exception. The further I drove, the more I felt like an intruder in a foreign land. When the town finally emerged from the embrace of the wilderness, it was exactly as I had pictured. A relic from a bygone era. The buildings, lined up along the main street like weary soldiers, bore the scars of time. Paint, once vibrant and welcoming, now hung in tattered strips from wooden facades. Windows, clouded with the dust of decades, offered a glimpse into empty rooms and forgotten stories. It was as if the town itself was caught in a temporal loop, stubbornly clinging to the past while the rest of the world moved forward. The streets were deserted, save for a stray cat that watched me with suspicious eyes before disappearing into the shadows. I parked my car near what appeared to be the town's diner, its neon sign flickering intermittently, struggling to spell out the word, eat. Stepping out of the car, I was struck by the silence. It was a stark contrast to the constant cacophony of the city. I took a moment to stretch my legs, my joints protesting after the long drive. The air was crisp, carrying the faint scent of pine and earth. As I ventured deeper into the heart of the festivities, the reality of the town's celebration began to unfold before me, in a panorama of bizarre and unsettling imagery. The streets, normally quiet and unassuming, were transformed into a bustling thoroughfare of color, sound, and enigmatic fervor. Ahead, a procession advanced through the center of the town, which had been cordoned off for the occasion. Flute players led the way, their melodies haunting and discordant, intertwining with the rhythmic beat of drums that seemed to echo the very heartbeat of the town. They danced with an abandon that was both mesmerizing and disconcerting, their bodies moving in ways that suggested a deep, almost primal connection to the music. Following the musicians was a spectacle that sent a chill down my spine. A crowd of men and women, their bodies scantily clad and smeared with vibrant reds and blues, bore upon their shoulders a statue so grotesque it could have been ripped from the pages of a dark fairy tale. Carved with painstaking detail, the figure depicted a half-man, half-goat entity, its face a fusion of human and animalistic features, complete with elongated, curling horns and fangs that protruded like those of a vampire. It was not just the craftsmanship that unsettled me, but the reverence with which it was carried, as if this effigy was more deity than art. The townspeople who followed were a spectacle in themselves. Paint obscured their faces, giving them an otherworldly appearance. Their movements were not mere walking, they swayed and twisted, seemingly caught in a trance induced by the rhythm of the procession. My task was clear yet daunting, to capture the essence of this peculiar festival, to peel back the layers of its history and traditions. But as I waded through the sea of painted faces and tried to engage with the locals, I was met with resistance. Questions were deflected with nervous smiles or outright ignored. It was apparent that there was a veil over this town, a collective pact of silence that no outsider was meant to penetrate. The more I observed, the more the festival's veneer of quaint eccentricity gave way to a sense of something more profound and disquieting. I watched as groups gathered in circles, their chants low and rhythmic, their eyes closed in fervent concentration. Stalls lined the streets, offering an array of odd trinkets and artifacts, each seemingly holding its own cryptic significance. The townspeople, their faces obscured by the fading light, moved with a rhythm that seemed orchestrated yet chaotic. I noted every detail, the journalist in me refusing to let the unsettling atmosphere cloud my observations. The wooden statue, the centerpiece of this bizarre ritual, loomed over us, its goat-headed visage staring blankly into the distance. As we ventured deeper into the forest that cradled the town, the natural chorus of evening creatures began to crescendo. Crickets chirped their twilight songs, and the rustling leaves whispered secrets of their own. Yet, amidst this natural symphony, the footsteps of the townsfolk maintained their steady, unnerving rhythm, as if keeping time with some unseen conductor. The air grew denser as the sun relinquished its hold on the sky, surrendering to the encroaching night. The darkness of the forest seemed to absorb all light, creating a canvas where shadows played and merged. The further we walked, the more I felt the weight of the unseen eyes that seemed to watch us from the darkened underbrush. 
The procession continued, the forest enveloping us in its ancient embrace. The night was now upon us, and with it came a chill that seemed to seep into my very bones. The townsfolk's faces, barely visible in the dim light, were etched with an expression that I couldn't quite decipher. Was it anticipation, fear, or something else entirely? The forest, a labyrinth of ancient trees, seemed to pulse with a life of its own. The branches above intertwined in a macabre dance, casting shadowy patterns that played tricks on my eyes. It was as if the forest itself was alive, breathing, and watching. The ground beneath my feet felt almost sentient, a soft, spongy surface that seemed to absorb the sound of my steps, muffling my movements as if urging me to tread silently, reverently. The townspeople, their faces now mere ghostly visages in the dwindling light, continued their procession. Each step they took was in perfect unison, a choreography that spoke of years of practice, or perhaps something more innate, more primal. Their chant, a melody of an unknown language, sounded both beautiful and foreboding. It echoed through the trees, bouncing off the bark and leaves, creating a chorus that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. Their faces, painted in hues of black and red, transformed under the canopy's dim light. The paint, meticulously applied, gave them an otherworldly appearance, as if they were no longer mere humans, but spirits of the forest, enacting a ritual as old as the woods themselves. Despite my journalistic instincts screaming for me to turn back, to retreat to the safety of the known, my feet carried me forward, deeper into the unknown. There was a story here, hidden beneath the layers of tradition and fear, a story that begged to be uncovered. But with each step, the unease in my gut grew, a tangible entity that seemed to feed on my fear. The ground beneath our feet became uneven, littered with fallen leaves and twisted roots that snaked across our path like slithering serpents. Suddenly, the procession came to an abrupt halt, jarring me from my thoughts. We had reached a clearing, a space where the trees reluctantly parted ways, as if to reveal a sacred spot. My eyes were immediately drawn to the centerpiece of this clearing, a massive ancient tree. Its bark was dark, almost black, resembling weathered leather that had seen countless seasons. Its roots spread out in a complex network, like the tendrils of some great beast, anchoring it firmly to the earth. Nestled at the base of this imposing tree was the wooden statue we had been following, its goat-headed form more sinister here in the shadow of the ancient arboreal giant. The townspeople formed a circle around it, their chanting intensifying, the sound echoing through the clearing and bouncing off the tree trunks, creating a cacophony that set my nerves on edge. My gaze then shifted to something that sent a shiver down my spine. A crude altar stood a few feet away from the tree. It was adorned with symbols that seemed to dance and flicker in the dim light, symbols that spoke of ancient rites and forgotten gods. The altar was decorated with relics made from what appeared to be animal bones, each piece meticulously placed, as if it held significant meaning in this macabre tableau. As the chanting continued, its rhythm more urgent now, the townsfolk brought forth a trembling goat from a small, hidden cage. The animal's eyes were wide with fear, mirroring the growing horror within me. I had only seen such rituals depicted in films, dramatic and sanitized. But here, in the cold reality of the forest, the ritual was starkly visceral, its dark intent laid bare. With a heavy heart and a sense of impending doom, I watched as they bound the goat to the altar. Its plaintive bleats were drowned out by the relentless chanting, a soundtrack to a ritual that I knew would haunt me for years to come. The leader of the procession, a shadowy figure cloaked in tattered robes, stepped forward with a solemnity that commanded silence. In his hands, he held a wicked-looking knife, its blade glinting ominously in the dim light. My heart pounded in my chest as he raised the knife high above his head, a gesture that signaled the culmination of this nightmarish ritual. In that moment, time seemed to slow. The air grew thick with anticipation, and a hush fell over the clearing. And then, with a swift, practiced motion, the leader brought the knife down. The goat's pitiful cries pierced the night, a sound so raw and agonizing that it threatened to overwhelm my senses. I stood there, frozen, as the lifeblood of the animal spilled onto the altar in a dark, crimson flow. This was no longer a distant story to be reported. It had become a visceral, chilling reality. 
Despite the revulsion churning in my gut, I knew I had to document this. Every horrifying detail needed to be recorded, a testament to the dark depths of human ritual and superstition. The townspeople moved with a renewed fervor now, their chants rising in a cacophony of eerie melody. They took turns drinking from a bowl filled with the goat's blood, each one seeming to draw strength from the act. Their faces, painted and grotesque in the flickering light, were alight with a fervent zeal that was almost palpable. Then, in a twist that sent a cold shiver down my spine, they turned to me. Eyes alight with an unsettling mixture of invitation and command, they presented me with a chalice. It was filled with the same dark, warm blood I had just seen spilled. Their smiles, wide and expectant, filled me with a dread that went beyond mere fear. It was as if they were initiating me into a world beyond my understanding, a realm of ancient and forbidden practices. With a trembling hand, I took the chalice. The metallic scent of the blood was overpowering, and for a moment, I hesitated. But the weight of their stares was too much to bear. Closing my eyes, I brought the chalice to my lips and took a small sip. The taste, coppery and warm, coated my tongue and sent a wave of nausea through me. It was a violation of every instinct, every moral fiber I possessed. With a trembling hand, I returned the chalice to the townsfolk. The metallic tang of blood lingered in my mouth, an unwelcome reminder of my forced participation in this grotesque ritual. I felt a wave of nausea and guilt wash over me, but my instinct for self-preservation reigned supreme. Surrounded by the fervor of the townspeople, my isolation became starkly apparent. My curiosity, once a driving force, now seemed a foolish gamble against these overwhelming odds. As the villagers resumed their ritualistic chanting, their voices crescendoed into a deafening roar. They circled the statue and the ancient tree, their movements becoming more frenzied, more hypnotic. I lifted my gaze, trying to detach myself from the chaos, but a sudden dizziness overtook me. The forest, once a mere backdrop to this madness, seemed to warp and shift before my eyes. The shadows, cast by the flickering light of lanterns, danced around me in a sinister ballet. They moved with a fluidity that defied the natural order, merging and twisting into shapes that my mind struggled to comprehend. The faces of the townspeople, already grotesque with their ritualistic paint, began to blur and distort, morphing into nightmarish visages that seemed to leer at me from every direction. Even the trees appeared to take on a life of their own. Their branches writhed and contorted like serpentine creatures, reaching out towards me with a malevolent intent. It was as if the forest itself had become an extension of the ritual, an active participant in the unfolding horror. Panic, raw and unyielding surged within me. I stumbled backward, my every instinct screaming to flee from this nightmare. But the townspeople were everywhere, their laughter and chants morphing into a cacophony that drowned out all rational thought. I realized then that my role in this ritual was far from over. I had unwittingly become part of a madness far greater and more terrifying than anything I could have imagined. Reeling from the effects of the blood and the surreal turn of events, the forest around me seemed to fracture and distort. Trees twisted into grotesque shapes, their branches snaking towards me with a sinister purpose. Shadows, elongated and warped by the lantern light, slithered and writhed on the ground, creating a tableau that defied logic. The cacophony of laughter and chants from the townsfolk rang in my ears, a haunting reminder of the nightmare I was desperately trying to escape. They closed in on me, their expressions twisted into grotesque parodies of joy. The very ground beneath my feet seemed to betray me, shifting and undulating like the waves of a tempestuous sea, making my every step precarious and fraught with danger. Driven by sheer desperation, I plunged deeper into the forest, away from the sinister ritual and the people who had ensnared me in their dark celebration. The shadows that had danced so malevolently around me now seemed to reach out, as if they were dark tendrils, eager to pull me into an abyss from which there was no return. My mind was a whirlwind of questions and fears. What had I unwittingly become a part of in this forgotten town? What hidden twisted histories were woven into the fabric of its traditions? With each labored breath, I felt as if I was being drawn deeper into a mystery far beyond my understanding. The forest around me took on an increasingly surreal aspect. Trees now contorted into unnatural shapes, their bark twisted and gnarled, 
resembling the weathered skin of some ancient creature. The air grew colder, sending shivers down my spine, and a profound silence enveloped the woods, broken only by the faint, haunting echoes of the townsfolk's distant chanting. As I ventured deeper into the dense undergrowth, the rustling sound stopped me dead in my tracks. My heart pounded against my chest, a drumbeat of primal fear. Straining my eyes to pierce the oppressive darkness, I caught sight of something unsettling, a pair of glowing eyes, like twin embers burning in the night. Something was out there, hidden in the shadows, and the realization that I was not alone in this eerie wilderness sent a jolt of terror through me. My instincts screamed at me to run, to put as much distance between myself and those unblinking, fiery eyes. I pushed forward, my footsteps quickening, each step an effort to escape the unknown entity that lurked just beyond my sight. The forest seemed to conspire against me, its tangled underbrush slowing my progress. But then, almost by miracle, I stumbled onto a lonely road. The sudden shift from the wild terrain to the relatively smooth gravel felt surreal. Dizziness overwhelmed me, a sensation akin to a hangover, though alcohol hadn't touched my lips in years. I stood there for a moment, disoriented, gazing down the road that stretched endlessly into the inky blackness. There were no signs of civilization, no comforting glow of streetlights or distant hum of traffic. Only the eerie rustling of leaves and the faint, haunting echoes of the townsfolk's chants that now seemed to fade away into the night. Taking a hesitant step forward, I heard the gravel crunch under my feet, a stark contrast to the muffled steps in the forest's thick underbrush. I had barely begun to feel a sense of relief when a chilling noise shattered the silence. A low guttural sound, primal and threatening, sent a wave of shivers down my spine. I spun around, my eyes scanning the dense foliage, and there they were again, the glowing, fiery eyes, peering at me from the darkness. They seemed like nothing more than distant stars, fallen from the heavens to earth. But as they grew closer, inch by measured inch, they transformed into something far more sinister. Panic coursed through me, raw and unfiltered. My heart pounded in my chest, a frenetic drumbeat that seemed to sink with my hastening steps. I stumbled backward, my mind a chaotic symphony of terror and confusion. The creature, obscured in the shadows, was a presence as tangible as the trees around me, its glowing eyes a beacon of dread. As I retreated, my mind raced to make sense of what lurked in the darkness. Questions spun like a whirlwind. Was this some guardian of the forest, a specter of ancient legend? Or was it a more tangible threat, a creature of flesh and blood, albeit a form twisted into something grotesque? My journalistic instincts, usually so sharp and focused, were drowned out by the primal urge to survive, to escape from this unseen terror. Then, in a moment that seemed to straddle the line between reality and nightmare, the creature emerged from the underbrush. It moved with a disconcerting grace, each step deliberate and unhurried. The sight of it struck me with a visceral horror. This was no mere animal, nor was it a figment of my imagination. It was an abomination, a grotesque fusion of human and goat-like features that defied all natural laws. The creature's body was a horror unto itself. Covered in matted wool, it hung in twisted, dirty clumps from its misshapen form. The wool seemed to writhe as if alive, adding to the nightmarish quality of its appearance. Its limbs were a perversion of the human form, hooves where feet should be, elongated arms that hung limply, as if they were devoid of bone or sinew. But it was the creature's head that elicited a terror so profound, so primal, that it threatened to overwhelm me. The head of a goat, replete with long, spiraled horns that twisted upwards, reaching towards an uncaring sky. The horns gleamed with a malevolent sheen, as if they were fashioned from the darkness itself. Its eyes, the source of that eerie, fiery glow, were windows to a malignant intelligence. They burned with a malevolence that seemed ancient and inscrutable. When the creature opened its mouth, the sound that emerged was a chilling distortion of a goat's bleat, a sound no living creature should ever make. It was a sound that seemed to vibrate through the very air, resonating with an unnatural malevolence. The sight of its fangs, reminiscent of a vampire's dripping with fresh red blood, was the final, horrifying detail in a visage so terrifying that it seemed to belong to the realm of nightmares rather than the natural world. As the creature stood there, 
regarding me with those burning eyes, a multitude of emotions battled within me. Fear was foremost among them, a fear so deep and visceral that it seemed to paralyze me. But there was also a sense of awe, of facing something so utterly alien to my understanding of the world. As a journalist, I had always sought the truth, delved into mysteries and sought to shed light on the unknown. But in this moment, faced with a creature that defied explanation, I felt a deep sense of my own insignificance, a realization that some mysteries were perhaps too dark, too ancient to ever be truly understood. I stood there, caught in the creature's gaze, my mind struggling to process the horror before me. Questions raced through my mind, each more frantic than the last. What was this creature? What was its connection to the ritual I had witnessed, to the town and its people? And most importantly, what did it want from me? Gasping for air, my chest heaved in ragged breaths, each one a desperate attempt to draw oxygen into my lungs. It felt as though I were drowning on dry land, my body rebelling against the terror that gripped me. Cold sweat drenched my back, chilling me to the bone, yet my skin burned with fear. I fell to my knees, the gravel of the road biting into my flesh through the fabric of my pants. Paralyzed, I watched as the creature moved towards me with a fluid, unnatural grace. Its multi-jointed limbs carried it forward, each movement a testament to its otherworldly nature. As it drew closer, its glowing eyes locked onto mine, and a sense of helplessness overwhelmed me. I was caught in the gaze of a predator, an abomination from a world that my mind still struggled to accept as real. Just as the creature was about to reach me, a beacon of hope shattered the darkness. The bright headlights of a car rounded the corner, cutting through the night with a suddenness that was almost blinding. The light momentarily distracted me from the horror before me, offering a glimmer of salvation in this nightmare. The car screeched to a halt beside me, its tires spewing gravel into the air, a harsh contrast to the eerie silence that had enveloped the forest. The driver's side door swung open with urgency, and a voice, human and filled with concern, called out from inside. Get in, it urged, a command that pierced through my terror-induced paralysis. I turned back to where the creature had been, expecting to see its monstrous form looming over me. But there was nothing. The monster had vanished as suddenly as it had appeared, leaving no trace of its existence. It was as if the creature had been nothing more than a figment of my tortured imagination a specter born from the darkest depths of fear. Seizing the opportunity, I jumped to my feet with a burst of adrenaline fueled energy. My legs, shaky and weak, somehow carried me to the car. I threw myself inside, the need to escape, to put distance between myself and the horrors of the forest, driving my every action. The driver, a middle-aged man with a weathered face and a rough demeanor, wasted no time in accelerating away from the scene. I breathed a sigh of relief, thankful to have escaped the clutches of the nightmarish creature that had pursued me. My savior, however, seemed unfazed by the ordeal. He glanced at me briefly, his eyes filled with curiosity, before returning his attention to the road. My name is Bill. I'm a hunter, and I've been lingering in the woods. You're lucky I showed up right here, or you'd have a long time to wander around in the woods still. He grumbled, his voice hoarse. What were you doing out in the middle of nowhere at this hour? I struggled to find my voice, my mind still reeling from the encounter. I... I was covering a festival in a nearby town, I stammered. But things took a very dark turn, and I had to run. The driver raised an eyebrow, his skepticism evident. Festival, you say? What kind of festival? I hesitated, then decided to reveal the truth. It was a strange one. I began, my words carefully chosen. The townspeople were involved in some disturbing ritual, and I was forced to partake in it. The driver gripped the steering wheel tighter and cast a leering glance at me. What kind of townspeople, what kind of town is this? He muttered. It's disturbing. You're scaring me, boy. As I recounted the events of the night, the driver's expression grew graver. But here's the thing, the driver finally said his voice low and measured. There's no town nearby. I mean, there used to be a town, but years ago there was some kind of tragedy there, and the inhabitants disappeared somewhere. So now there's no town with residents nearby, and the nearest living town is a few miles away. There's a festival going on there. 
but there's no way you can go to a festival in the middle of this forest. My blood ran cold at his words. I knew what I had seen, what I had experienced, was real. But his assertion threw me into a deeper sense of unease. How could I be in a city that doesn't exist? What happened to me? Story 6 My morning shift at St. Maron's Blood Donation Center began as any other, with the distant hum of the city barely permeating the sterile calm of our facility. I found myself in the lab, surrounded by the methodical hums and beeps of machinery, diligently calibrating the equipment for the day's procedures. Thoughts of the upcoming weekend fluttered at the edge of my consciousness, a welcome distraction from the monotony, until a sudden commotion from the donation room jarred me back to the present. I abandoned my tools hastily and made my way toward the disturbance. The scene that unfolded before me was far from ordinary. A middle-aged man, a donor, was in the throes of a panic attack, his arm flailing erratically, causing droplets of blood to stain the immaculate white floor. It's all right, just try to relax, Sarah, our ever-composed nurse, soothed with a practiced calm that belied the urgency of the situation. Dr. Elias Renfield, the center's most enigmatic figure, approached with a grace that seemed almost unnatural. Please remain still, sir, he urged, his voice imbued with a peculiar, soothing quality. I observed somewhat in awe as they collaboratively pacified the donor. The crisis was swiftly averted, but not before a smear of blood had found its way onto Dr. Renfield's hand. What I saw next unsettled me. A fleeting moment where Dr. Renfield, with the ghost of a smile, subtly licked the blood from his skin. Was it a trick of the light? or something more sinister. Everything okay here? I inquired, feigning nonchalance as I joined them. Just a minor hiccup, nothing to be concerned about, Dr. Renfield replied, his hand now clean, though the enigmatic smile lingered. Sarah exhaled a sigh of relief, yet her voice betrayed a hint of bewilderment. Nervous donors are part of the job, but I've never seen Dr. Renfield react quite so instinctively. At that moment, Lucy, Another nurse and Sarah's confidant entered with an expression that blended confusion with concern. There's something odd about the blood inventory. The numbers aren't making sense. What exactly do you mean? I pressed, my interest now thoroughly piqued. It's as if we're missing blood bags, but then again, the inventory seems to align. It's baffling, Lucy explained, her expression reflecting her perplexity. Sarah scanned the room, her brows knitted in thought. Could this be an error in record-keeping, or a miscount, perhaps? Possibly, Lucy conceded, but it's as though the numbers are fluctuating. Despite double-checking, the discrepancy remains elusive. A chill coursed through me. The image of Dr. Renfield's subtle action replayed in my mind. A comprehensive inventory check is in order, and perhaps a review of the security footage might shed some light, I suggested, masking my growing suspicion. An astute suggestion, Daniel, Dr. Renfield concurred. Sarah, Lucy, I'd appreciate your assistance with Daniel on this matter. Meanwhile, I'll examine the security recordings. As we dispersed to our respective tasks, a gnawing unease settled within me. The day's events had taken a peculiar turn, and an instinctual part of me sensed that there was more to this anomaly than a simple error in inventory. As the evening shadows lengthened across the city, I stepped out of St. Maron's Blood Donation Center, the day's oddities weighing heavily on my mind. The discrepancy in the blood inventory had been irksomely unresolved. Records and counts checked and rechecked, only to align perfectly. Dr. Renfield, ever the embodiment of calm, had assured us that the security footage revealed nothing unusual. A simple miscount, perhaps, he had suggested with a nonchalance that didn't quite reach his eyes. The bustling city seemed to buzz with a hidden tension as I made my way through the dimly lit streets, my thoughts a tangled mess. The image of Dr. Renfield discreetly licking blood from his hand looped incessantly in my mind, its sinister implications refusing to be dismissed. Turning into a shadowy alley as a shortcut, a prickling sensation crept up my spine, the unmistakable feeling of being watched. A fleeting glimpse of a cloaked figure in the darkness sent my heart racing. My steps quickened, echoing against the narrow walls, as a sense of foreboding enveloped me. 
Abruptly, my phone broke the eerie silence, its ring sharp in the twilight air. It was Sarah. Daniel, are you all right? I can't stop thinking about the inventory issue. It's just so... unsettling. Who would take blood bags? It's all so bizarre. I glanced nervously over my shoulder, picking up the pace. Yeah, it's odd, I replied, my voice uneven with a mix of exertion and anxiety. But maybe we're overanalyzing this. It could just be a mix-up in the records. But what if it's not? What if there's something more sinister at play here? Sarah's voice trembled slightly with apprehension. Let's not leap to dark conclusions, I said, though a part of me resonated with her fears. Emerging from the alley, I let out a silent breath of relief. The street was better lit, the figure gone. Be careful, okay? This situation is giving me the creeps, Sarah urged. I will. And you too, I assured her, before ending the call. The remainder of my walk was uneventful, but the sensation of being tailed persisted. I found myself continuously glancing back, half expecting to see the mysterious figure, but the streets remained eerily deserted. Once inside my apartment, I locked the door and leaned back against it, my heart still pounding. Despite the safety of my home, the unease clung to me. Peering out of the window, I scanned the quiet street below. It was empty, yet the nagging feeling of being observed lingered. I tried to divert my mind by preparing dinner, but my thoughts were inescapable, circling back to the day's unsettling events, the enigmatic blood inventory issue, Dr. Renfield's peculiar behavior, the unnerving feeling of being followed. The thread seemed connected, yet I couldn't piece together the puzzle. Was this paranoia, or was I on the cusp of uncovering something truly sinister at the center? Morning dawned, casting a new light on the city. I headed back to St. Marilyn's Blood Donation Center, the previous night's fears seeming almost foolish in the bright light of day. The city was waking up, and so was I, ready to face another day's work. Upon arriving at the center, I noticed Sarah and Lucy engaged in a deep conversation. I greeted them with a casual, good morning, and made my way to my office. After settling in and tackling the morning's tasks, I stepped out into the quiet reception area. No patients had arrived yet, and the tranquility of the morning was a welcome change. Yawning, I glanced around the room, my eyes landing on the television broadcasting the morning news. A report on missing persons caught my attention. To my astonishment, I recognized several faces from the list of the missing, faces I had seen at the center. Lucy, sitting across the room, was also watching. Her eyes widened in shock as she too made the connection. Oh my God, she gasped, her hand covering her mouth. These are our patients. We exchanged a look of mutual disbelief. I nodded silently, the realization hitting me hard. These weren't just random faces. They were people we had interacted with, people who had come to our center. As we were processing this revelation, the entrance door swung open and a man in his 40s dressed in a suit walked in. He confidently approached the reception desk and flashed a badge. Detective Michael Hardy, he introduced himself. I'm investigating the disappearance of several individuals. It seems they all visited your center, so I'd like to ask a few questions. Lucy, recovering from her initial shock, replied, Of course, we'll help in any way we can. The detective began by inquiring about the number of staff working at the center and expressed his desire to speak with each of us individually. Lucy quickly called Dr. Renfield and got in touch with Sarah. Soon enough, each staff member was interviewed in a separate room. I was the last to be called in. Detective Hardy sat across from me, a stern look on his face. Do you recognize any of these faces? He asked, showing me photos of the missing individuals. Yes, I remember some of them. I replied, my voice steady. And did you notice anything suspicious? Can you recall where you were on these specific dates? His questions were direct, his gaze piercing. I answered as best as I could, trying to recall the days in question. The detective nodded, jotting down notes. Then he set aside his pen, leaned forward and looked me squarely in the eyes. A lot of lives are at stake, sir. Are you sure you haven't seen anything out of the ordinary? I hesitated, my mind racing. Should I mention the blood bag discrepancy and Dr. Renfield's odd behavior? After a moment's deliberation, I decided to divulge everything. The missing blood bags and the peculiar actions of Dr. Renfield. 
Detective Hardy listened intently, his pen moving swiftly across his notepad. Once I finished, he thanked me for my cooperation and dismissed me. As I left the room, a myriad of thoughts swirled in my mind. The connection between the missing persons and our center was too significant to be a coincidence. And Dr. Renfield, what role did he play in all this? His enigmatic demeanor, which had always seemed charming, now appeared sinister in light of recent events. After Detective Hardy concluded his interviews, he bid us farewell, leaving behind his contact information and urging us to reach out if we recalled anything pertinent. The center was still devoid of patients, so we, Sarah, Lucy, Dr. Renfield and I, congregated to discuss the morning's unsettling developments. The women were visibly shaken, discussing in hushed, anxious tones, while Dr. Renfield stood apart, his expression a brooding enigma. Eventually, we dispersed to attend to our respective duties. Around noon, while sorting through some equipment in the storage room, I stumbled upon a tattered notebook hidden among the old journals and maintenance logs. It was tucked away in a corner, only coming to light as I searched for a specific manual. Curiosity peaked, I opened it, and what I read made my blood run cold. I won't recount everything verbatim but share the essence of the disturbing content. People are like pigs, they taste as they're fed. Those who live on junk food, canned products, and modern fast foods have blood that tastes utterly foul. But truly healthy individuals, those without GMOs, as some might say, have divine blood. Once you taste it, it's hard to resist. The biggest problem is predicting the flavor of the blood, and biting everyone indiscriminately isn't feasible. Fortunately, this center has been my solution. The notebook contained more than these ghastly musings, detailed descriptions of procedures I dare not mention, but the writings were unmistakably those of a madman. The notes were penned with such realism as if the writer genuinely relished the taste of blood. I carefully concealed the notebook inside my coat and left the storage room, my mind a whirlwind of horror and disbelief. Back in my office, I immediately called Detective Hardy and informed him of my find. He instructed me to bring the notebook to him, providing an address. During lunch, I told my colleagues I needed to step out for a bit and would return soon. Arriving at the location Hardy had given me, I handed over the chilling notebook. The detective's expression grew increasingly grave as he read. He thanked me for the information and sent me back to the center. Returning to the clinic, I couldn't help but scrutinize my colleagues, wondering who among them could be the author of those twisted words. Dr. Renfield, with his peculiar behavior, topped my list of suspects. I resolved to keep a closer eye on him. The next day at work felt like walking into a storm cloud. Sarah approached me with a troubled look. Listen, I haven't mentioned this before, but I've noticed some odd behavior from Dr. Renfield, she whispered. Surprised, I shared what I had seen the previous evening, but kept the discovery of the notebook to myself. We agreed that Dr. Renfield's actions were suspicious and that we needed to follow him after work. That evening, as Dr. Renfield left the building, we quickly got ready and trailed behind him. He walked with purpose, leading us to an unknown destination. Eventually we reached an abandoned building, its windows dark and foreboding. We watched from a distance as Dr. Renfield surveyed the building, peeking through windows before entering. Hesitantly, we followed him inside. The interior was a maze of dust and decay, with corridors leading off into shadowy recesses. We crept down a staircase to the left of the entrance, each step creaking under our weight, our hearts pounding in the heavy silence. At the bottom, we found a dimly lit space, the door slightly ajar. Pushing it open, we were met with a scene from a nightmare. Inside, about ten people were chained to the walls, their mouths gagged, many of them bloodied and bruised. It was a sight that churned my stomach. As we entered, we saw Dr. Renfield leaning over one of the captives. In horror and without thinking, I shouted, alerting him to our presence. He turned, his expression one of shock and confusion. What are you doing here? He stammered. Before I could respond, I saw the terror in the eyes of the captives, their gaze fixed on something behind me. A cold realization washed over me. Sarah was standing behind me. I turned to face her and was met with a forceful blow that sent me crashing against the wall. Dazed and in pain, I looked up to see Sarah's face contorted into something inhuman, her mouth open in a hiss, revealing sharp fangs. 
she lunged at Dr. Renfield, knocking him down and sinking her teeth into his neck. His screams filled the room as she fed on his blood. I thought it was the end for us when gunshots rang out. Detective Hardy burst into the room, firing at Sarah. She howled in rage and leaped to the ceiling, evading his shots before crashing through a window and disappearing into the night. The detective called for backup on his radio, and soon the building was swarming with police and paramedics. Dr. Renfield was unconscious, and I, with broken ribs, was taken to the hospital. The following day, Detective Hardy visited me. He explained that they hadn't found Sarah and that explaining the situation was a challenge. But with multiple witnesses, he hoped people would believe our story. Lying there with pain racking my body, I wondered if the world would ever understand the horror we had uncovered. Story 7 I remember that summer with a clarity that often evades other memories of my early 20s. It was a time when the days stretched long and lazy before us. My friends and I lived in a rhythm dictated by academic calendars and the pulsing beat of city life. On one particularly sweltering day, as the city baked under a relentless sun, we found refuge in a quaint cafe tucked away in a quieter part of town. The cafe, with its mismatched furniture and walls adorned with local art, a place where we'd while away hours over iced coffees and aimless chatter. It was there we met Nikki. She breezed into the cafe like a gust of cool wind, her laughter ringing clear and her eyes sparkling with an irrepressible vivacity. Nikki was one of those rare people who radiated warmth and charisma, drawing others to her almost effortlessly. She joined our table, invited by a mutual friend, and within minutes, it was as if she'd always been part of the group. In the weeks that followed, Nikki became an integral part of our circle. Her wit was as sharp as her infectious humor, and she had a knack for storytelling that could leave us hanging on her every word. We would gather around our usual table, the aroma of coffee in the air, and Nikki would tell us stories about her childhood in a small town far from the bustling city. As summer vacation loomed, Nikki invited us to spend a week at her family's place in her hometown. The idea was met with lukewarm enthusiasm at first. None of us were particularly keen on leaving the comfort of the city for a sleepy, unknown town. Sensing our hesitation, Nikki's eyes took on a mischievous glint. Let me sweeten the deal, she said, leaning in to share a secret. There's a legend in my town. They say there's a real vampire living in the neighborhood who preys on both animals and humans. We laughed, of course. The idea was ludicrous, something out of a gothic novel, not real life. But there was something in the way Nikki told the story, her voice dropping to a hush, her eyes alight with a mix of fear and excitement that made us pause. Curiosity, that most human of traits, began to take root. So, we agreed. We decided to journey to this small, unknown town, if only to break the monotony of our city lives. A few days into our stay in Nikki's hometown, the novelty of being away from the city began to wear off, replaced by a sense of peaceful monotony. The town, with its narrow winding streets and quaint houses, seemed to exist in a bubble, untouched by the rush of the outside world. Our days were spent exploring the local sites, with Nikki as our enthusiastic guide, sharing stories and legends of her town. The idea to camp in the forest came up spontaneously one evening, as we sat around Nikki's kitchen table, the remnants of a hearty meal laid out before us. The forest, a vast expanse of dense trees and winding trails, bordered the town. Equipped with backpacks laden with provisions, our sleeping bags rolled tightly, and a large tent that promised to be a challenge to set up, we set out towards the forest. The sunlight filtered through the dense canopy, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. We found a clearing near a wild lake, the water, a clear, deep blue that promised a refreshing escape from the summer heat. Setting up the tent proved to be an adventure in itself. Nikki took charge, directing us with a mix of amusement and exasperation as we fumbled with the poles and canvas. Eventually, the tent stood, albeit a little lopsided, a testament to our collective effort. The lake was a welcome respite, its waters cool and invigorating. We swam and splashed around, the cares of the world seemingly a million miles away. The picnic that followed was simple, sandwiches, fruit, and cold drinks. But in that moment, it felt like a feast. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, a hush fell over our group. The playful atmosphere of the day gave way to a sense of anticipation, a feeling that something was about to happen. 
We gathered around a makeshift fire, the flames casting a warm glow on our faces. Nikki, with a flair for Drama, began to tell the story of the vampire, her voice a low, captivating murmur that seemed to blend with the crackling of the fire. Simon, she said, was a boy shadowed by misfortune from his first breath. His mother, a vibrant soul loved by all, passed away giving birth to him. In this town, where superstitions run as deep as the roots of the old forest, people whispered of a curse. She paused, and in that silence, the forest seemed to lean in, as if eager to hear more about Simon. His childhood, Nikki continued, was marked by illness and solitude. He was in the hospital a lot, couldn't get better. He was raised by his father, a man broken by grief yet devoted to his son. But tragedy struck again. His father was found dead under the most bizarre circumstances. Nikki's voice dropped to a whisper, compelling us to lean closer. The body was… it was as if every drop of life had been drained from him. A shiver ran through me, and I wasn't alone. Around the fire, I saw my friends pull their jackets tighter, glancing uneasily into the shadows cast by the flickering flames. Nikki's eyes, reflecting the fire's dance, held a somber depth. The police were baffled. No signs of struggle. No clues to what happened. It was as if the life had been sucked out of him, leaving behind a husk. She looked around our circle, her gaze lingering on each of us. After the bewildering discovery of his father's lifeless body, an event that shook our small town to its core, young Simon was taken in by his grandmother. I still remember the first time I saw her. She was an enigmatic figure, her back straight as an arrow, her eyes sharp and piercing. Despite her advanced age, she moved with an energy that belied the wrinkles etching her face. The townsfolk had always been wary of her. I recall hearing hushed conversations at the local diner where people speculated about her age and origins. Some joked that she had been around when the town was founded, a comment that seemed less like hyperbole with each passing year. Her resilience and vigor were subjects of much speculation and unease. Simon, once a frail and sickly child, began to change under her care. It was gradual at first, a newfound color in his cheeks, a brightness in his eyes. But soon, the transformation became undeniable. He grew stronger, healthier. The change in Simon was the talk of the town, neighbors theorizing about the sudden shift. The most persistent rumor was unsettling. They said his grandmother, whom some whispered to be a witch, was adding human and animal blood to Simon's milk. It was a ridiculous idea, other residents thought so but pets did start going missing in the town. The rumors about his grandmother intensified. Some said she was seen wandering the woods at night, others claimed to have found strange symbols etched into the trees near her home. The tales were many, each more fantastical than the last, but the undercurrent of fear was real. The days in our town seemed to stretch longer after Simon's transformation under his grandmother's care. His behavior became increasingly peculiar, only adding to the swirling rumors. He rarely ventured out during the day, and the townsfolk noticed a peculiar pattern. Simon could only be seen wandering the streets after sunset, his figure a fleeting shadow in the twilight. The rumors about him running around town at night like an animal weren't unfounded. Old Mr. Jenkins, who lived two houses down, swore he saw Simon one night. He said Simon's eyes glowed in the dark, a pair of luminescent orbs that seemed to pierce through the night's veil. Simon's grandmother, the enigmatic figure at the center of so many tales, passed away suddenly. Her death sent shockwaves through the town. Many had thought her to be almost immortal, a constant in our ever-changing world. Her demise was as mysterious as her life, leaving behind more questions than answers. But it was Simon's disappearance that truly unsettled the town. He wasn't found at his grandmother's house or anywhere in the neighborhood. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Days turned into weeks, and still, there was no trace of Simon. The once omnipresent rumors began to wane, replaced by a silence that was almost as disconcerting. People started to move on, the mystery of Simon and his grandmother slowly receding into the background of our daily lives. The night was deepening around our campfire, and Nikki's voice seemed to be the only thing anchoring us to reality as she continued the story of the strange occurrences that followed Simon's grandmother's death. The flames flickered, casting ghostly shadows on our faces, as we listened, rapt and unsettled. A few months after the old woman passed away, Nikki said, her voice taking on a somber tone. 
the town was shaken by a series of gruesome discoveries. She described how it started with livestock, cows from the local farms found lifeless, their bodies drained and withered in a way that was eerily reminiscent of Simon's father's death. The air around us felt colder as she spoke of the growing unease in the town. Pets began to disappear. Cats, dogs, even birds from their cages, only to be found in the same desiccated state. The townsfolk, already on edge from the rumors surrounding Simon and his grandmother, started to whisper of a curse, a malevolent force lurking in the shadows. The horror escalated when the first human victim was found. It was a hiker, Nikki recounted, well known in town. He had gone into the woods and never came back. The body, when found, bore the same disturbing signs, as if every ounce of life had been sucked out of it. A palpable fear had gripped the town, Nikki explained. People were afraid to venture out after dusk. The police, once dismissive of the townspeople's superstitions, were now compelled to act. They organized search parties, patrolled the streets at night, and warned everyone to stay vigilant, Nikki said. The hunt for what was now being called the monster killer was underway, an ominous phrase that seemed to hang in the air like a dark cloud. That's when it all started to unravel, the threads of speculation and rumor weaving into a tapestry of fear and accusation. Nikki's voice, steady and solemn, filled the air as she continued her tale by the dying embers of our campfire. At first, it was just whispers, Nikki said, her eyes reflecting the fire's glow. But then, more and more people began to believe that Simon was behind it all. She paused, letting the weight of her words sink in. They said that when his mother was cursed, Simon had been reborn as something else in her womb. A monster. A vampire, Nikki continued, almost hesitantly, as if saying the word aloud gave it power. Fed by his mother's blood, he became a full-fledged creature of the night. The story took a darker turn as Nikki described Simon's alleged escape. He knew he was being hunted, that he couldn't stay in the forest or the town. Her voice was a whisper now, barely audible over the crackling of the fire. So, he left. But not forever. Sometimes, Nikki said, her gaze distant. He comes back, and that's when the eerie events begin. She spoke of nights when the people living near the forest would hear the sound of a child sobbing. At first, they would rush out to help, but the crying would stop abruptly as if it were never there. Days after the mysterious crying, murders would occur in the town. They would last about a week, and then, as suddenly as they began, they would stop. It's as if Simon gets bored or satiated, and then he disappears, leaving the town in an uneasy quiet. I looked around at my friends, their faces half-lit by the fire, eyes wide with a mixture of fear and fascination. As Nikki's story drew to a close, the fire had dwindled to a mere smolder casting long, flickering shadows across our small circle. Years later, of course, it all became legendary, she said, her voice now a mere murmur against the backdrop of the nocturnal forest. But even now, when townspeople hear a baby crying in the woods, they don't think it's just an animal or the wind. They think it's him, Simon. They tie up their cattle near the forest, she said, as a sort of sacrificial offering, hoping Simon will feed on them and leave the townspeople unharmed. The idea was chilling, a ritual born of fear and superstition, a testament to the power of the legend that had grown around Simon. Nikki looked around at our faces, lit intermittently by the dying fire. He's expected to come in the next few days, she added, a seriousness in her tone that I hadn't heard before. We should be careful. We could try to see him, but we should do it just before dawn, for our own safety. As we prepared for bed, the story hung heavily in the air around us. I could tell by the quiet, contemplative expressions of my friends that they too were processing the tale, each lost in their thoughts. Lying in my tent, I listened to the sounds of the night. The rustle of leaves, the distant hoot of an owl, the soft murmur of my friends breathing. The story of Simon, this boy turned into a creature of the night, seemed to merge with the darkness around us creating an atmosphere thick with anticipation and dread. That night was restless for me, fraught with unsettling dreams that clung to the edges of my consciousness, even as I awoke. In my dreams, I wandered through a landscape of blued and dried corpses, a nightmarish vista that seemed to stretch on endlessly. I woke up with a start, my shirt clinging to me, damp with sweet. The tent felt stifling, almost suffocating. I needed air, 
to escape the remnants of the dream that seemed to linger in the close confines of the tent. Slipping out quietly so as not to disturb the others, I found myself in the cool embrace of the night. The sky above was a tapestry of stars, a stark contrast to the darkness of my dream. In the city, such a view was rare, the lights often drowning out the celestial display. Here, it was a breathtaking sight. As I sat near our dwindling campfire, my eyes tracing the constellations above, a sound broke the stillness of the night, a quiet, plaintive crying. It was so faint, I thought I might have imagined it, but then it came again, unmistakable this time. A baby crying. Curiosity, mingled with a sense of adventure, spurred me to my feet. Everyone else was asleep, their breathing steady and even in the quiet of the night. The story Nikki had shared flickered in my mind, but I pushed aside the unease it brought. Grabbing my smartphone, I thought I might capture something, anything, that could explain the crying. I didn't venture far from our camp. The forest was a different world at night, shadows dancing between the trees, the sounds of nocturnal creatures a soft backdrop. And then I saw him, a boy, about ten years old, standing near a tree. He was rubbing his ease with his hands, crying. The supernatural haze I half expected to see was absent. He looked like any ordinary child, lost and frightened. He was dressed only in a tank top and shorts, barefoot, his small frame shivering in the cool night air. My instincts as an older brother kicked in. I rushed over to the child, concern overriding any lingering fear from Nikki's story. I draped my jacket over his small shoulders, trying to offer some comfort. Hey, it's okay, you're safe now, I said, my voice soft and reassuring. The child looked up at me, his hands falling away from his face. That's when I saw it. His tears weren't the usual clear drops, but a startling, vivid red. Blood. He was crying bloody tears. A cold shiver ran down my spine, my heart pounding in my chest. Every horror story, every urban legend I'd ever heard, paled in comparison to the sight before me. The realization hit me like a bolt of lightning. The boy with the bloody tears, standing so close, had to be Simon, the vampire from Nikki's stories. Fear gripped me, icy and sharp. My voice, shrill with terror, shattered the stillness of the dawn. Help, vampire. The next second was a blur. Simon, or the boy I believed to be Simon, bolted away with a speed that defied reality. It was as if one moment he was there, and the next, he was just a vanishing shadow among the trees. My friends, roused from their sleep by my screams, emerged from their tents, sleepy and disgruntled. The early morning air was chilly, and they wrapped themselves in blankets, irritation evident in their half-awake faces. What's going on? Mike asked, rubbing his eyes, trying to make sense of the situation. I was panting, my heart racing, as I tried to explain. I saw him, Simon, the vampire. He was crying blood, I said, my words tumbling out in a rush. Their reactions were a mix of disbelief and annoyance. Sarah, always the practical one, frowned. Are you sure you weren't dreaming? It's been a long night with all those stories. But I was adamant. I'm telling you, it was him. He ran off into the woods. As the sun rose higher, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, my friend's skepticism grew. They suggested it was a nightmare, a trick of the light, or perhaps a lost child. But nothing could shake my conviction that what I had seen was real. From that day on, things changed. My friends started to make fun of me, playfully at first, but then with a hint of mockery. There goes the vampire hunter, they'd jest, or, seen any blood-sucking creatures lately? Despite their teasing, a part of me couldn't let go of what I'd seen. Every rustle in the bushes, every unexpected sound in the night, brought me back to that encounter. I spent my days replaying the moment over and over in my mind, questioning, analyzing, trying to make sense of it. I couldn't shake off the conviction that what I had experienced was real. The image of the boy with bloody tears was etched into my memory, a haunting reminder of a truth that everyone else refused to see.